<laughs> what's up, everyone? Oh, let's have a day. Look who's joining the party today. The legend himself, Cam Maven, joining the show. What's up, Cam? How you doing? You ready for a, a full FT today with us? I, I, I'm just mad at AJ. It's about time. I mean, Jesus, AJ, you called me last offseason. You check on me. See how my team is doing. I mean, what's, what took so long to get me on, man? Hey, I don't care what you're doing. I just need to know about some kids that we have at my high school that play for you, and you ruined them. So I got to figure out how to fix them. <laughs> am I am I part of the Velo group? Am I, uh, am I part of the, Am I part of the Velo group? All we want uh, is I mean, Velo. No, you are actually because one of your kids. It's all he wants to do is throw hard, even though he can't throw a damn strike. Well, hey, that's your job, man. You're supposed to get him ready to send to me. I thought that's what we were doing. Last I mean, year you said, I, hey, hey, hey I, can, I, I can send him to you. You just got to get him to work hard, which we ain't going to yeah, name no names. That, but hey, that's we the key with a lot of these kids, ain't it, man? I tell you, humility and, and a little bit of drive and discipline, man, it's lacking these days. Well, th th I mean, yeah. <laughs> no comment, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Kratz Cam has you beat. 15 years in the bigs and how many teams how many orgs were you a part of cam 10 kratz you 14 come on cam you oh, ain't even close i was yeah, chasing, cam. i was chasing my boy but i couldn't i couldn't get i couldn't catch him <laughs> yeah but we're talking big league organizations not minor league organizations yeah yeah That's yeah it. yeah i only count the big league ones i'm with you you already know you know you know mine you know mine are like there there's there's two that are that are sketchy there's two that are sketchy the Red Sox, I never got in a game. So do we count that or no? No, it don't count. See? So See, thank you. Thank you. It doesn't. If it you don't count. It spring training, it does not count. No, no, no. I, I was like in the big leagues. I was there for two. I killed spread for two and a half days. So <laughs> that counts. You, you didn't You didn't get in a game. You, you don't fit on Immaculate Grid, so that doesn't count. Okay. Oh, okay. So Immaculate Grid is our, is our barometer now. I like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what's the other one? What was the other one? Ah, the Padres. They had to put me on the roster or release me. And they put me on they they traded me. So they had to put me on their roster. So technically for like a minute, I was a Padre. That don't count either. <laughs> See, so how many are we uh, down I, to I, now? I get it. How many? So, so you're so you at twelve then. So you're about, about you're at about twelve then. I'm at nine no, I'm at I'm at nine big league organizations that I played in a game with AJ Przinski parameters. Did you play for 12 big league teams? No, 11. 11, okay. So you're still ahead of Cam. Both y'all got me beat. Y'all, the people say I moved around. Shit. Uh, yeah, like you, you did your thing though. You know, you know what I argue all the time, AJ? You, you, might, you might appreciate this. I argue all the time when I'm around people you know, catchers don't get enough love. And I always ask people, I just pose a question. I say, if you really sit back and look at A.J. Przinski's numbers, when you talk about catching, is he not one of those guys that you consider putting on the Hall of Fame ballot? I'm just saying and not just – Hey, I got two votes, there. dude. I got Absolutely. two. I got two votes. Two. I mean, I, I'm just – I, I, I wanted to ask you that, A.J. Like, do you ever think about that when you look at your numbers, what you're able to do? I'm just curious no, I, since I'm on here for the first time. I was time. very fortunate, Cam, and I appreciate it. But I'll also say this. You know, if I would have been fortunate enough to stick with one organization, you know, and have the media say, oh, this guy's the greatest guy in the history of the world, I might have gotten three first place votes. But, you know, when you start bouncing around and people say things, the people are like, ah, who's this guy? But they don't actually – that's why I think sometimes the Hall of Fame is, 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 is one of the hardest things to get in. Because if you're not part of the right organization and the part, part of the right media – saying the right things about you you just don't get the votes i mean yeah, i just want i wanted to give you your flowers like, man i just you know played i appreciate time, that played with, a, played with a lot of good guys cratchy knows and i just think catchers sometimes when i look at that hall of fame ballot i don't feel like catchers get the love or get enough love i feel like it, it's weighed a little bit heavier than the other positions and i just think you guys from what you guys do 162 really 190 plus when you add spring training uh, I just want to give you your flowers while I have a chance hey, to do it because after this, Cam, I won't do it on camera ever again. Cam, Cam don't give Kratz because you said 162. Kratz was like 22. So, like, he was he had it easy. He played four? Four? 40. Oh, four? <laughs> I'd, get, I'd get in four games. I'd get in 40, four to four game, 40 games. 
But the big thing, like counting Jermaine, spring? Was that counting spring or not counting spring? Not counting <laughs> spring. No, 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 no. <laughs> you no, never no. play with me then. <laughs> no, that's that is not. I would get. I would start forty games. I would get in forty games. Oh, okay. Yes, appearances, appearances. All right, let's yeah, let's yeah. get to the most important part of the day. It is Jackie Robinson Day every single April fifteenth here in Major League Baseball, and obviously a day to remember. Jackie made his MLB debut on this day in nineteen. 19- 47 um there's the uh the socials from mlb life legacy and impact on baseball in america are profound cam you got to lead the way here and tell us what this day means to you to current players and also to spin it forward for us in terms of the game and getting black players involved in the game getting black executives involved in the game where are we at in your opinion yeah, you know, I think we're heading in the right direction, especially now with me being on this travel ball circuit. And you're seeing a lot more uh, black athletes really gravitate towards baseball. I think when you start to really do your homework on the longevity that you can have uh, in the game, I think the athleticism that is much needed and much wanted in the game, I think is important. And I think we have to, you know, thank Jackie Robinson for opening those doors. Um, for me personally, I appreciate my father who, uh, you know, shared you know Jackie's story as a young kid so growing up I always wore 42 uh Jackie Robinson Willie Mays those are come some of the guys that I was you know taught about growing up so Jackie Robinson uh he opened up a lot of doors even right now for us to sit right here be able to share you know our love for the game talk about the game what it's given us all I think we have to look back at Jackie Robinson and really appreciate the sacrifice uh the things that he went through the things that he endured so that we all could share and play the game that we love. I think it's an important day, and I'm glad MLB continues to do it bigger and better every year. You feel like this is the one day that MLB, like, knocks out of the park? Like, they get it right? Because, like, I feel like even even in, our, even in the 2020 COVID season, we still had Jackie Robinson Day in July. And it's like one of those days that if you have a theme day, players are kind of like, eh whatever but this is a day that everybody gets behind in my opinion this is a day that everybody gets behind and really loves yeah I, you're right Kratzian. and just to be honest I remember you know having seasons where I was a little banged up coming out of spring or I was kind of on that bubble like hey was I going to be healthy and I remember just trying to get back right or you might go tell a trainer t- trainer staff or tell a, you know the staff hey I'm good because I just wanted to be a part of that celebration and that ceremony. So you're absolutely right. This is one of those days where I think when you talk about guys being more willing to, to you know, appreciate and, and, and be more, you know, dialed in and more open to fans and, and more into the ceremonies, I think this is one of those days where guys are like, hey, we definitely got to give it back. And then wearing that 42 is special, you know. So I remember missing a couple of those and, you know, it hurt, man. So, uh, you know, it's special to, to don that 42 a number that is retired and you get the privilege to wear it. It's huge. And and we'll talk more about it too, as we roll along here on Jackie Robinson day, um, April 15th, always. And, and Dave Sims is going to join us later. Who's super, super well-spoken and one of my favorite baseball broadcasters. And we'll get into it with him as well. Um, all right, let's, let's run through the weekend. Cause it was ridiculous. And we have a new seg to start off today. So who's hungry? Beef. Scott Kenny, none of that. That's absolute. That's absolute what? false. false Scott Kenny, none of that. Scott's alley. Uh, he just butter. doesn't understand. Yeah, if you're gonna cook steak, you gotta put butter on it. I don't even cook my steak. Stuff. I just eat it like that. Just, you just give eat me it a raw, like raw meat. Who did said he, he just ate raw meat and it came out? He was on like 400 billion milligrams of steroids. What that liver for? king? Liver king. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I, I, he's like, I only eat raw meat, and then it came out. He was on like. 10 billion things of steroids. If you yeah. didn't believe he was in the first place, then you were. Well, I mean, you know, hey, I don't want you know, to like accuse guys. You know, some of us yeah, played in that him. era. Then you didn't. Yeah, you didn't want to. Then you didn't play in the early 2000s. If you if yeah, you didn't think he was on steroids. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, you didn't play in the 90s if you think that guy wasn't on him. Yeah, you need to watch yeah. the show more. All right. So let's do this. The, I think the biggest beef from the weekend was jerks and Profar and the Padres against Will Smith and the Dodgers. So the backstory is Gavin Stone is dealing on Saturday. He sits down the first 15 hitters, and then Profar squares to bunt. Next pitch, a little high and tight, nothing crazy. We'll see what these guys have to say about it. 
And um, Profar said, quote, for a moment, I thought it was because of the bunt and he's throwing a perfect game, but he wouldn't do that throwing a perfect game. It was just heat of the moment. I wasn't trying to get the team energized or anything like that. We don't need that. We have a good team. We don't need any of that. Dodgers were pissed that he tried to you know, create some beef out of it. And Will Smith said post game, I don't know why we would have thrown at him. He's kind of irrelevant. One day later, Profar with a double that scores three that ends up being the deciding factor in the game. And Manny Machado calls him essentially Mr. Relevant. That's fun. That's good. That's I good love theater. this, dude. This is what'd you say? NBA? It was a typical Tuesday. In That's the NBA. called Tuesday in the NBA. I love this. Are you kidding me? Like, first of all, I love Profar got pissed because they threw one at him. Mm-hmm. And then Will Smith said what he said. And he said it with his chest. He's like, why would we mm-hmm. throw at him? There's trust me. There was dudes <laughs> I played against that like we're like, we're you quit throwing at me. And I'm like, we ain't throwing at you, dude. You're an out, bro. We want you You're to hit. <laughs> trust me. We want you to hit. We don't want to throw at you. We don't need you on first. So, yeah, I mean, I love this from Will Smith. Normally you don't get this, but the Padres, Dodgers, mm. there's some heat there. After 2022 when the, the Dodgers finally lost, the Padres finally beat the Dodgers. I was at that series. It was unbelievable. It was like the World Series, and they lost, obviously, to the Phillies. But there is some heat in this rivalry, and I like it. I am here for it, and I want more of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think personally I love it. I think there's some gamemanship on both sides. Hey, that's a part of Jerks and Profar's game, right? We're trying to win baseball games. If we need base runners, I'm trying to get on, and I like it from the other end. That's old school. Okay, you square the butt. Here's a little Tim music. But what I really love about it the most is I think when you really take a step back and look at this series, right, this rivalry, this Padres-Dodgers rivalry, we all can say the Dodgers have got the best of the Padres, right? The Padres are tired of being punched in the mouth is what I saw, a team that's like, hey, we don't care what you guys went out and did this offseason. Guys on the field know you don't play baseball on paper. And the Padres, on the other hand, they went out and made some sneaky moves too to bolster their rotation. Uh, Their bullpen looks a little better than I think people might have thought. So I think they have a team that says, we don't give a a crap what you guys are doing. We're not scared of you. And I think they needed something when you look at the past. It's been questions of who's the leader in that Padres clubhouse? Uh, What is their identity as a team? And I think this may be something that could help them start to come together, put the the selfish uh, me guy baseball to the side and say, hey, you know what? Let's put everybody on notice in the NL West. They're talking about the Dodgers. They're talking about the Diamondbacks. But we have a squad that can compete and play. So I love what I see. And I think the Padres need a little bit of that. They need a little bit more fire in them when you talk about, you know, making a statement and showing the Dodgers that, hey, we're not scared of you guys. Padres have no problem getting up against the Dodgers. They're like, oh, we're going to beat the big bad Dodgers. Their issue is, are they just going to play meh against the rest of the teams? So hopefully this series, they can carry it over to – the other 100 and let's see 149 games that they play in the season because they only play the Dodgers 13 times so you need to have that fire all the time and I think this team could be really good I also think it was exactly what Profar said I think he in the heat of the moment got a little heat got like he got he got too into the moment and didn't realize this dude's not throwing it he's not throwing at me but if he was thrown at you, that would have been a perfect time to break up the no-hitter. Perfect time to break up the no-hitter. I mean, the perfect game. Let that Jose Tabata right in your elbow. No more perfect game, Max Scherzer. <laughs> Jose Tabata, yeah. By the way, he showed him how relevant he was last night when he hit that double we just showed. Yes, Profar is a, yes. a good player. Profar is yes. – I mean, I played with him. I mean, don't forget he was the number one prospect in baseball one time. I mean, he hasn't lived up to that hype because that's a lot of hype. But he's a good, solid major league player that's done a lot in his career. So, I mean, listen, I, I mean, listen, Will Smith said what he said, and I'm all for trash talking because Lord knows mm-hmm. I said plenty Love of it. it. Usually not to the paper, but, I mean, I would say it to dudes. <laughs> and uh, fine with it. Like, great. I like yeah. it. Baseball, we need Let's that energy this year. Reese Hoskins got it gotta start off right. Mm-hmm. I like it, man. Baseball needs this. Thanks. I'll say this, too, about Profar. People were ripping him last year. They're like, he's done. He can't play anymore. He's a negative war player, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay. He was pretty good the year before that. Yep, 2022, from what I recall. He was above average hitter, can play a a number of different positions. He was bad last year. Like, he was not swinging the bat well for the most part last year. He also got a late start, don't forget, last year. He got a late start. Yep. He was with Colorado. 
And then when he was with San, uh, San Diego, he was better. And that's why they brought him back. I mean, that's a bargain. He's essentially Remember, on a league he put, minimum he, deal. He played in the WBC for uh, yep. Curacao. Yep. Right? And then he didn't sign. He wasn't signed until I think spring training was either over or almost over. Mm -hmm. it, it's amazing, though, and Cam and Eric can talk on this. Guys that miss the spring. <laughs> like, look at Blake Snell. Oh, he struggled his first two starts, right? Mm -hmm. There's something about being in spring training that matters. And I know that people are going to say, oh, you can build up. You can do this. But you're always in a rush. If you're not there from the beginning of spring training, you're always trying to catch up, catch up. Can I catch up? Can I catch up? Right? Jordan Montgomery, they've done a good job kind of holding him back, the Diamondbacks, right? Blake Snell, they threw right into the fire. Like, oh, and his first start was – and then his start this weekend was not good in Tampa, right? These guys, but they need time to catch up. It takes a, it takes a minute. I'm sorry. It just does. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, you're – yeah, you're absolutely right, man. I've seen guys, at least, and I can speak from my own, ex you know, experience. You know, I, I needed all the spring training, and sometimes I needed the first week of April just to feel like, okay, all right, finally, my time and my rhythm is back. So it, it definitely makes a difference. Everybody isn't the natural can just wake up, roll out of bed, and just, you know, just just rake. So it definitely takes time for guys, especially a switch hitter, too. This is a guy who has to do it off both sides of the plate. So it takes a little bit longer for him to get synced up and, 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 and timing the rhythm going. And by the way, the Dodgers lost the series. Padres win the series. The Dodgers issued 14 walks in yesterday's game, eight coming from James Paxton. So the Dodgers are not perfect. In the offseason, the fans that were complaining and saying, why even play the games? Um, this is why we're playing the games right now. San Diego's not, good, afraid no, they're not, they're, af they're not afraid of them. No, they're not afraid of them. They are not. San Diego's not afraid. They're the one team that is not afraid of them, I mean, right now. Right. And the uh, so let's look. Willie Adamas and James McCann getting into it a little bit, and the Brewers took the series from the Orioles. The Orioles took the last game on Sunday with Corbin Burns pitching, although it was decided kind of later on in that game. But what'd you think of Adamas versus McCann? That's McCann. more of like your standard benches clear nothingness yeah, in my mind. I, no? I mean, I like McCann. I don't know Adamas. You, you, Kratzy knows Adamas better than I do, but. I just I, to me it was like he hit the home run. He he watched it. That's what people do now. Who cares? Who gives right. a, that's what I don't care. Like who cares? Yeah. And he hit, and then McCann got mad and you know it's kind of like one of those half-assed baseball brawls. We're like, eh, we're gonna talk and then the you know. And the only thing I do love that James McCann did is he didn't take his mask off. He's like, come on, let's go. And he kept all that gear on. Let's go. <laughs> come on, like you can hit me all you want. It ain't gonna hurt. I love that. But you know, it just I don't know. This is just a typical baseball. You know, two grown men mad. You know, one team's winning, one team's losing. They're mad, but the Brewers look good, man. The Brewers can bang. We don't, I don't think we realize how good. First of all, William Contreras, banging for the leadoff spot. Went deep off Burns yesterday, right to lead off the game. But their offense is really good, which I don't think we saw. Even with the dude that hits like Weimer. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. Hey, no Weimer's wonder that crazy. dude can't hit with that. Like that. I mean, how he, did he cleaned it up. Like, he cleaned it up. Hey, I'm no, not, not, I was watching the game yesterday. He's like. Hey, he's a monster. Oh, here comes he's the pitch. A big dude, he's a big dude. dude. To play center, he is a big Kratzky, dude. I was, like, I was like, who is this donkey? I mean, patrolling center. But to add to your point, I'm glad you touched on that, AJ, because I thought about this last night. As I watched the Brewers and, and nobody, even me, I am honestly can say I, I didn't expect them to be here. But one thing I did know, being around Pat Murphy, and I don't know if any, either of you guys had a chance to be around Pat Murphy, uh, Pat Murphy, I had him in San Diego. He was the he was the AAA manager in San Diego. And one thing that I, I learned very quickly about Pat Murphy is he got people. You know, he, he puts the right people around him as far as baseball, and he knows the game, don't get me wrong. But I think sometimes what goes unsung is having a manager that gets people as much as they get baseball because he knows how to get people to, to be them best, the best version of themselves. And I think that's important. I, I sat down with him, and I remember he had me thinking – I would run through a wall for this dude, man. I just It's something special about that I don't think we talk about. We see how well they're playing. But it takes a guy like Pat Murphy to want to show up and go, yo, we're going to prove everybody wrong, and we want to show up and play for this guy. So let's give Pat Murphy some love, man. I, that goes a long way knowing people. That is exactly what it is. When you want to be a manager, when you want to be a manager, it's all about your people skills. You can right. – yeah. X, X's and O's, they're whatever. But Murph, he gets it. Murph gets it. I, I was super surprised when they were hitting Contreras in the leadoff spot. <laughs> they knew something I didn't know. I mean, <laughs> it pushes it pushes Yelly back 
and not needing to be that like walk, get on base kind of thing. He is for a young player. William Contreras is the steal of trades so far in the last two years, in my opinion. Dude, I saw him play. I played with him in the Gulf Coast League when 2016 when I was on the fake DL with the anal problem. Um, I went down there and played, and they're like, oh, this is this is Wilson's brother. And I was like, oh, and I saw him play, and I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know, I mean, I think he was like 16 or 17 years old. We won the – we celebrated with the division. We had to pop those bottles of uh, sparkling cider because none of them were old enough to drink except for me. Stop. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> It was really sparkling. <laughs> it was lighter. sparkling grape juice because I because we were like we're if we win we're gonna clinch the division in like the fifth inning we were up like ten to nothing and I'm like I told the clubhouse guy I go dude you better give me some champagne he goes these guys can't drink I go well better get me some champagne and better get them because we're gonna at least do something yeah juicy juice it doesn't yeah. count when you're on the it doesn't count when you're on the IL I wasn't on the IL I was active on that team you were on the you were anal fissures if Cam didn't know that's what you <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 if people at home do your homework on anal, anal fissures, I had one when you're in Miami. Bro, oh, my in goodness. Oh, right. my God. You actually had one of them? Oh, my uh, goodness. Hey, Sillium Husk. Fl- and, and I was mixing something with like orange juice, Sillium Husk. It, it helped. Do your homework, people at home. It's funny. No. Oh, you know, I, it's I don't funny. It is funny. Family. I don't wish I went I went on the at the time I went on the IL. I want to say I missed 15 days, bro. I no. I was I was down. Maybe long. Is that was that the actual reason they printed on the paper? I, I think they might have printed something different, but I'm gonna tell you what it was. <laughs> now that I wasn't playing. That's a little embarrassing so, you, to print at the time. I don't think, I don't think you, you don't know the story or? though. You don't know the story. So in 16, because we played together in 15 with the Braves, in 16. Uh, at the end of the year, they're like, yeah, we're going to put you on the IL. You know, you ain't hurt. And I, I said, all right, great. Get to September. And they're like, well, I'm like, what am I going on the IL for? And they're like, what do you want? And I said, can I pick? And they said, yeah. And I said, I want anal fissures. And they're like, no, you got a hamstring pull. And I was like, no, I want the other one. They're like, well, people won't believe that. And I'm like, well, they're not going to believe I pulled a hamstring either. And they went with hamstring. But now it's funny that you actually have them. Hey, the only guy I remember story. ever having them was, was Matt Suey. The Matsui, the little uh, switch hitter from Japan. Yes. Okay. Oh, from the yeah, Matsui. He, he's the only right. guy I ever remember going on that deal. Back then it was a deal. And everyone's like, what the, the most hell is that? Pa- One of the most painful things I've ever went through. I've had labrum surgery, wrist surgery. Oh. I don't wish that on my worst teammate, bro. Oh, man. <laughs> do, do not, do not, and everybody listening, do not search that. That will ruin a man's search on YouTube if you search <laughs> on Google. <laughs> do not search that. Do not oh. switch away from this show. Hey, it hits next, different when it's real yeah. life. It hits different when it's real life. <laughs> oof, oof. I'm in pain the rest of the show, but let's bring in our first guest on oh. FT Live today. Uh, our friend, Chuck Garfine, joining us right now. White Sox anchor, reporter, podcaster. Doesn't know what he just jumped himself into. And Would you like to officially introduce Chuck's name that you call him? Uh, Garfinkel. Garfinkel uh, in the house. It's, is he, do we, are we allowed to say our Chuck Garfinkel or do we have to say yeah, you, the, the worst team in baseball? Do we name. say the worst I'm team in baseball? Chuck. Chuck. Do we say the worst team in baseball's Chuck? You know, I don't know how I follow <laughs> an anal injury conversation, but uh, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there was ever somebody that could do up. it. <laughs> right. The, the White Sox season so far feels like that. Wait, <laughs> I'm going to do one positive to start, though, because this is news. Okay, Chuck? Tommy Pham signs a contract. Some people are like, why is it a minor league contract? You can probably help explain. But if it was not, uh, if it was a major league contract and you're up for waivers and all that crap, so he's going to be up soon. But w- what do you know about that? I mean, it's probably going to happen. Sounds like it's going to happen. And listen, the White Sox uh, were dealt a bunch of injuries. Injuries were going to happen, but they lost their two, three, four hitters in Robert Moncada and Jimenez within a nine day stand. Uh, a nine day, nine day span. And, you know, you do that for most teams. Okay. Th- that's a big blow to your offense. You need other guys to pick up the slack. And unfortunately that really hasn't happened with this White Sox team offensively other than Gavin Sheets. They don't have any bangers in AAA who are ready to come up. They tried to ask for Colas for like a day, then brought him down. That was kind of questionable. Um, so Robbie Grossman, they signed him near, during spring training. He's here, Tommy Pham. So a lot of veteran guys, to play right field, maybe some left field, and try to fix this offense that has been – I mean, it's, it is the worst offense I have seen in my life for a White Sox team to start the season. 
And they are off to their worst start in 124 years. They are two and 13. That's where things are at right now. Cool. Well, let's let's bring some positivity to it because the head of player development is now the general manager of this team. And yet there's no player development players to come up. Are there some that are just too young that he developed in his seven to was it eight years that he was director of player development or is there just we i need i need like a vision through the trees because i'm not seeing anything but this big fat tree in front of me that's the worst start in 102 years yeah so i would say that right now this is kind of like the bridge year where you're basically putting band-aids on as many on as many things as possible uh and that's what they technically from where i sit what is happening but what you're saying is a whole other conversation and you know we're trying to even someone in my seat is trying to figure out okay so you know if you are the head of player development for a minor league uh, system and you don't really choose the players necessarily okay so that is you are responsible for what you're given and so there is some uh, if you want to call it blame or whatever it might be, uh, there is a reason to be like, well, what, what did Chris Getz do with all the players that he was given? Um, there's also coaching involved. It's the players themselves. And, you know, so I don't think he was in the draft room saying, I want this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. If he had those choices, maybe he would have chose different players. So you can look at the results and the results are not there in this White Sox minor league system, at least for the moment. Uh, they've done a lot of they've done made some really good trades i think uh since the trade deadline that started with rick Hahn and kenny williams except for the jake Berger trade i'll take that to my grave that's like one of the worst trades in the history of the team unless jake eater can really be something i'm hoping for you jake eater but um you know i think that this is you know we'll see you know the minor league system has gotten better because of the trades but in terms of development and bring guys up here that were drafted by the team went through the minor league system it's a small number of successes chris Getz was overseeing the minor league system over this uh time uh where you know why they weren't able to do it that's a much deeper conversation and a lot i don't have all the answers to that one all right chuck so here's the deal they yeah. you, you say he didn't pick the players but no minor league coordinator picks the players and every other team has developed guys. So, the, I mean, that excuse might fly for White Sox fans, but they haven't developed anybody. I mean, Colson Montgomery is supposed to be coming, right? He yeah. finally hit a triple-A home run the other night, and it was like the this Red Sea parted again, right? Because he has struggled in triple-A so far, right? Noah Schultz is supposed to be coming, right? I mean, I haven't heard much about him. They got, uh, what, Nastrani pitching tonight, right? He's supposed to be their other big prospect guy. But, but the other thing is, like, I like Andrew Vaughn, but he hasn't he hasn't happened to a point where you're like, oh wow, he's the third overall pick. He's had a he's been okay, but this year has been a struggle, which I get it's early. But you know, it, it's just like you look at the names and you're like, man, I, and this wasn't even going to be my question, but now that you know you brought it up, it's like, okay, I get it, and 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 I no longer work for the White Sox because of this exact conversation we're having, but it's. It, it, the facts are the facts. Like every other, like the, my my whole point has been, listen, I like Chris Getz. I played with Chris Getz, you know, whatever. But if you every other team finds a twentieth round pick, it's like, oh man, we developed this guy. You can blame coaches, you can blame draft, but everybody. Once you get past about the tenth round, everybody's draft. Everyone's like, oh, we'll take him. He'll sign. We'll take. It's not like you're like, oh man, in the thirteenth round, we're gonna steal a first rounder. So I, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just. Maybe it's just me, but I don't know. I'm kind of fed up with the Rick and Kenny excuse. I'm kind of fed up with the, oh, we didn't draft right excuse because they've switched scouting directors in the middle of that. Let's not forget. It's not the same guy doing all the drafting, right? They've switched everything, and the results are only worse. And that and listen, they should have just come out and said, hey, we're going to suck this year. And everyone would have been like, okay. But they're like, no, we're going to try and compete instead. They're like, no, we're going to be good. Uh, you're off. I think there was a question in there. I'm not sure. No, they're um, just it's just me being like, I, I, it's just, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, like I watch Ozzy on TV every night and he says his things, you know, and you, you and Ozzy have to, you know, what's, what is it? Put lipstick on a pig, whatever the saying is, right. To try to make it pretty. But man, I feel, I almost feel sorry for you guys some nights. Cause damn, what, what are you going to say at this point? 
Yeah, we are, our job is to wear it. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> the games have been pretty bad. I mean, listen, I don't think now the White Sox have come out officially and said, yeah, we are going to suck this year. Uh, they haven't even used the rebuild phrase or term. Um, but, you know, for those of us who cover the team, I'll just speak for myself. I mean, I said that best case scenario, I think this team can win best case if everything goes right, which never happens. I said they'd win 80 games, but I said, realistically, I think this, Damn! Team I said, if everything, <laughs> everything, right. everything. everything like Luis Robert becomes everything. Can pitch. The good, like, everything yeah. Needs to go right. yeah, everything. Realistically, I think this team can win 70, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they won 60. So, like, that's what I and I think a lot of White Sox fans are kind of going into that this team will not be good, but you know, you can be surprised. But the last thing this team needed was okay, you play three games to start the season against the Tigers, you lose three one run games. Then you have three guys get hurt. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying, like, all these things have happened. It's like a worst case scenario beginning. And on top of all of that, you've got Andrew Vaughn, uh, Andrew Benatendi, like all these guys who are hitting under 200, under 200. No one would have predicted that. And if they were hitting, say, 220 for the season, which still isn't great, you're probably winning a few more games. Your record is still not good, but it's not the worst in the history of the franchise after 15 games. So when you start a season like this, everything's magnified and we start having these conversations about how bad this team can be. Will they lose 120 games because you have nothing else to go on? Yeah, gang, I want I want to ask this and I won't I won't be so negative, but it's just it's more so about the vision of the White Sox and I see them uh, you know, add a guy like Tommy Pham, like you spoke about, Robbie Grossman and and I'm just curious on you know, I believe those are type of guys when you you talk about Tommy Pham, you ask questions about Tommy Pham. I, I think it's as much as a, uh, you know, one thing to say the lineup, but one thing to try to develop a mentality, a, a identity. And Tommy Pham is a guy that I don't care who he plays for. He's not going to take too kindly to winning. He's going to come in there and I think he's going to set a president an attitude where it's like, hey, whether we lose or not, we – we need to go out and compete. We need to play for each other. Do you think bringing Robbie Grossman and Tommy Pham in is a part of maybe trying to develop a mindset? Because these guys are considered winners, I think, if you ask their peers. But also, too, let's be honest, they're probably going to be some trade pieces come, uh, you know, the trade deadline to try to bring back some prospects when you look at it. But is there any type of outlook on, hey, let's bring some guys in that have a business-like mentality that don't like to lose and maybe – that can rub off on some guys because when you talk about injuries here and there, I, I never want to say anybody's faking, but I think there is a thing where you learn how to play through injury, where you learn how to play through being banged up and hurt. And I think you add a guy like Robbie Grossman, guys like Tommy Pham, who might say, hey, how about a little bit more t toughness and tenacity when you talk about a mindset? Do you, do you have anything on, from that aspect? I can go on a half hour on this conversation. <laughs> um, so... Tommy Pham and Rex, Rex I, keep, I keep calling Robbie Grossman Rex Grossman because I, I, I love it. You, me too. That's, that's like fine. It. That's I fine for me. I love it. I, do it I love it. it. That's my that's second time I've done it. So Robbie Grossman and Tommy Pham played in the World Series last year. Okay, and there, the things that I saw Chris Getz trying to do with this team, this major league team this year, the two biggest things were fix the defense, which was awful last year, and it's not great to start this year and fix the clubhouse. Now, when I started talking in, during spring training about fixing the clubhouse, there was a section, a loud section of White Sox fans who hated this idea. Who cares about the clubhouse? Give me a great team, Who guys who mash, play discipline. Like I want all that too. But as you guys know, I'm sure at least, I'll speak for I think at least AJ, the clubhouse last year was a mess. It was a mess and Things got really fractured in there, and they needed to fix the clubhouse. The kind of guys they can bring in, like hired guns to try and fix the clubhouse, are a Robbie Grossman, a Tommy Pham, a Kevin Pillar, a Martin Maldonado, people like that. It's not going to mean this team's winning the division or even having a winning record, but they had to at least address that because it was completely in disarray. So, AJ, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Do you like the idea of 
fixing a clubhouse that is frac was fractured last year. And you may not win, but at least set the tone and have a team play the right way, even though it hasn't played on the field or two and 13. But what do you think about that? And I get you, I'm, I'm, I like to know your guys thoughts. Cause I've, Chuck, here's, here's my, my question. There's a lot of people who think I'm crazy. Chuck, here's my thing. Here's my, here's my thing with what you're saying. I, I understand that. Like you want to fix the clubhouse, but you also have to bring in guys that are, you know, they, I mean, they had Mustakas in spring training, they had Chavez, they had Pilar. They had all these guys, they got rid of them right at the end of spring training. You're like, wait, we're trying to fix the clubhouse. Why are we getting rid of the guys you wanted to fix the clubhouse? I mean, I know they brought in DeYoung, they brought in Maldonado, right? But Martin Maldonado is great when you have great pitching, right? Right? I mean, he, he we know he's not going to hit. He's great when you have great pitching, okay? Well, but, you know what? If you have young pitching, I'd want to have Maldonado back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Okay. But does Maldonado is not off to the greatest start to the season defensively as I see it. But also, if you ask anybody last year in Houston, he wasn't great last year defensively either. Yeah, I mean, I know Dusty was the, the, the you know, swore he was the pitcher whisperer. But, I mean, you had Verlander, Fromber, Christian Javier, you know, Orchidi, Garcia. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty good fivesome to, to run out there, right? Now it's and, and, again, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, yeah, you can fix the clubhouse, but you also need to bring in guys that can, tr- can contribute. And I know they lost Eloy. I know they lost Louis Robert. I know they lost Juan Mancata. But as a White Sox fan, Chuck, can you really count on those guys to play 150 games? No. The X factors for me for this entire season offensively were Mancata and Jimenez. <laughs> That's where things were at. That's where things were at. And so the fact that it's a week into the year and both of them went down, not good. Not good at all. So uh, they've been relying on and hoping and praying that Jimenez and Mancada would reach their potential, at least in one of these seasons. I mean, Mancada has shown flashes at times. Jimenez hasn't stayed on the field since, I think, 2019. So, uh, and he stayed on the field last year, but he wasn't the guy that we expect. So uh, that's why a 60-70 win season seemed in the cards for this team this year. Well, if they need me to come in and be you, Dinus Haslam, play on Sundays once a week, I'll get the culture right. <laughs> I'm calling the White Sox right now. I ring, can ring, be you, ring. Dinus Haslam. I still can get you 30 bags right now. You know, if AJ's behind the plate. <laughs> okay. Okay, I like that. I like that smoke. Is there any chance that, A, somebody's going to apologize to Tony La Russa, or B, Pedro Grafal does not make it through this season. Okay, you're saying apologize to Tony because... He got a lot of flack for what was going on with this team, and... The man fell has... asleep, Kratzy. Fell asleep in the hey, game. I'm not... I'm just saying the team did better when Tony was there. As, as hard as that... As hard as that to say, do we need to apologize to Tony La Russa? You know who I'd apologize to? I'd apologize to Rick Renteria, who had True. his team. Okay, before that. pretty good, and he lost his job. But you're right about Tony La Russa. They won 93 games. And I had to be reminded, I, I saw it for myself, and I was surprised. They won 93 games in 2021. And Luis Robert, I believe, played 68 games in the regular season. And Aloy Jimenez played 55. So they had a lot of support on that team. The bench did a great job picking up the slack. Guys from AAA, from the farm system, like Danny Mendick and Gavin Sheets, helped that 2021 team. Um, and then if you're Pedro Grafol, I mean, you lost 101 games last year. This is not looking good. So uh, things have got to turn around this year. You've got to see the results on the field. You know, and he wants this team to be playing fearless and be aggressive and – uh, be selfless and be technically sound, as uh, he put it. So far, we're not seeing much of that. Chuck, did for, well. When are they going to stop pressing? That was my favorite thing I saw this weekend. The whites. I mean, you're two and thirteen. What are you pressing for? <laughs> like you. Pre- I, I don't. I mean, I, I just. I saw that article and I was like, they got. We're going to stop pressing. I'm like, what? Wait. You're, you're what? Um, but anyways, did you see? I'm sure you saw it, the the Joe Cali thing that he wrote about. Uh, Pedro Grafol, is there any truth to that? I mean, I know they came out and denied it, but I mean, they have to deny it. But is there any truth to that story that, you know, they were talking about firing Pedro last year and Jerry stepped in and said no because of dead money? What I was told is that report by Joe Colley, what I was told was that that report is untrue. 
That's all I can say. Um, that they would, you know, they, that Jerry Reinsdorf has not, you know, had that edict with uh, Pedro Grifol. So that's all I can say. Um, but what was the first thing you were saying? Because I wanted to respond to that. Oh, the pressing. The pressing. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you never pressed. You never pressed when you look up at your, your, you're making like, you know, good money and you're batting 130 in April and your team stinks. You didn't press offensively. Well, of course I did, but I also was never on a team that was two and 13. So I didn't really know that. that oh, was so you're possible. saying like, forget, listen, you but, might but well here's the thing. If I, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, because I'm two and 13. No, but here's the thing. If I, if I'm, if I'm in the White Sox clubhouse and I'm clearly not, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, if you want to have a meeting, fine, but let's have a meeting of like, let's get back and figure out what we do well. It seems like they don't know what they do well. They're like, oh, we're going to fix the defense. They make three errors, like it seems like every night, right? Oh, we're going to run the bases well. They don't run the bases very well. Oh, we're going to, we're going to be like a small ball team. They don't bunt, right? They don't hit the ball out of the park. So you got to figure out what you are. And I don't know what they are. So for them to be like, we're pressing, what are you pressing for? Like, you yeah, know, like so, what's, what, maybe we should press different buttons. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's for, I can't speak for any of these guys because I haven't, you know, I'm not in the clubhouse on a daily basis. I don't know exactly what they're thinking, but if Pedro Grafal is saying they're pressing, I can just go on and that. But in terms of an identity, this team hasn't really had one for a bit. And it seemed <laughs> like they would, were starting to at least attempt to develop one with playing smart playing good defense and, you know, bringing a, a, a big team attitude to the field every day. Those were words and seemingly some actions in spring training, but during spring training, they had the worst record in baseball in the spring training, which doesn't always, as you know, translate to what's going to happen in the regular season. But in this case, it has. We thought they'd have better play discipline. They were last in the majors in walks last year. They were middle of the pack during spring training. Two weeks into the season, they're oh. doing a little bit better, mainly because they signed Robbie Grossman. He's got like seven walks in a week. So, um, you know, it, I think my guess is once they lost Robert, Moncada, and Jimenez in a week, like that was just such a shock to the system of this offense on top of the bad start that they had that they just that think that is where the press scene's coming in. We're just like, I mean, you know, you got Kevin Pilar batting cleanup, Gavin Sheets batting third. Like who expected this to happen two weeks ago? And here they are. All right. So you you realize like you're you're mentioning all these things. Their triple A team is awful has also got awful. Let's not forget. They're the worst team in triple A by like leaps and bounds. <clears throat> so, I mean what what give me some hope as a white so I need hope. Chuck okay, I'll you, give you hope. You are, you are the choke. You are the Chuck that is supposed to give me hope. So you and or Ozzy, I need hope going forward that I need to tune in and watch the White Sox because no one's going to the ballpark. I mean, I saw I've seen pictures. There's like nobody there. So like the tickets are like three dollars, Chuck. So tell me why I should spend my four dollars and go to a game and watch this team. <laughs> well, part of my job besides watching the White Sox is watching the Charlotte Knights and watching the Birmingham Barons and Winston Salem Dash. <laughs> And it was really nice when the White Sox were good for a few seasons. I didn't really have to spend too much time looking at the minor leagues because I was really liking what I was seeing in the major leagues. Right, so. Um, so, uh, they did have a great few days in the minor leagues. So Colson Montgomery has had, hit two home runs in back-to-back -back days in AAA. I mean, he wasn't even playing that much in spring training. And the way Ozzy put it is like he feel, Ozzy felt like the first two weeks of AAA ball for Colson was essentially still part of his spring training. Um, the pitchers that they have gotten back in these trades look really good. Drew Thorpe from the Padres, uh, Jairo Iriarte uh, from the Padres, Noah Schultz, who is their number two prospect. He had a game. He actually gave up four runs in one inning for the Winston-Salem Dash. And once he gave up those four runs, he's like, all right, I'm going to fix this. He struck out six batters in a row. Edgar Caro, who they got in the Lucas Giolito trade, has had three home runs over the weekend. So there are some good things happening in the minor leagues. So you can hang your head on that. Gavin Sheets has been good. Garrett Crochet has been phenomenal. Michael Kopech has been great out of the bullpen. 
There are slice Jordan Leisure, who they got in the Joe Kelly, Lance Lynn trade. He has not given up a run yet. And Nick Nostrini, who they also got in that trade, is making his major league debut today, starting against the Royals. So there are slivers of good, but when you're two and thirteen, you got to look for some of those slivers because um, it's been rough to say the least through fifteen games. All right, Chuck. Well, besides that, everything's great. So <laughs> this was really productive. We just wanted to air it out. And hey, the White Sox did sign Tommy Pham, so at least maybe he can bring them a little bit of offense. Uh, no, actually, I guess I shouldn't say that. Reportedly are close to signing Tommy Pham. I'm, I'm hoping that happens so that there's something interesting to watch with this team. And, and it gives them a little bit of, of trade deadline juice, too. And also, I was just pissed because Pham had a good year last year. You just want to see someone like it's that. It's start called collusion. Collusion is a real thing. <laughs> Say it, Speak say it, Cam. Oh, say it with don't, your chest. Don't get me. That's another conversation we can have. <laughs> well, we'll let we'll let Chuck jump. Chuck, thank you very much. Great to have you on, man. We'll watch you on uh, pre and post. Wait, are you on? Wait, do they have a game today? That's all. They do. Who do they play? <laughs> the Royals. Oh, Royals. Oh boy. Well, then that'll make Getz happy, and the rest of them because they're all Royals. Royals versus Royals. They can tonight. all go say hello to each other. <laughs> 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 That's okay, uh, Chuck. You can laugh. I am. I'm laughing. I actually, I don't laugh. I actually cry every night when I turn it on. Yeah, I mean, my family would be like, "How'd the White Sox do?" And I then I laugh because I'm like, "Do you even have to ask that question?" <clears throat> yeah. Well, listen. The Royals swept the White Sox in four games in Kansas City. Let's see how they respond here this week. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, the Royals are impressive. They lost 106 games last year. 106, and look what they're yeah, doing you know this what, year. Impressive. Yeah, but you know what they did, Chuck. They spent some money and brought in. Not only did they fix the clubhouse, they fixed the rotation. They fixed their position players. They fixed the bullpen. You know how they did it? Money, 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 money. That's right. Money rules the world around me. Yeah. (laughs) All right, Chuck learned a lot here. Chuck, great to have you on as always. We appreciate you, man. Hope you enjoyed it. These guys are on one today. Always (laughs) enjoy it with you guys. Thanks, Garfinkel. I'll see you you sometime. Thank you, AJ. (laughs) Uh, you can follow Chuck at Chuck, uh, G-A-R-F-I-E-N. Watch him on pre and post. Uh, him and Ozzy are, are a treat. Oh, they my are gosh. They are they are, it might be the best. You know the best thing the White Sox have going for them this year, and this is sad, is the campfire milkshake that everyone says is yes. just unbelievable. It's all over socials right now. I saw so I gotta, I gotta get the there. Olympian that was there this weekend. Simone Biles. Yes. Simone Biles and her brother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and yep. can we get, can we one second? One thing I took out of that, let's give Ricky Ritzeria, organizational karma. That's where it went downhill. Again, back to people. Crassie talked about it. We spoke about Pat Murphy. Knowing guys, one of the one one of the best people I've been around in a clubhouse, Ricky Renteria. Talk about getting guys to play well and getting on somebody's ass when they need it. Accountability. They that's where it went downhill. That's what I heard in that conversation. Hey, don't forget, Cam. He also got fired right before they brought in Joe Madden, the other Chicago, and they won a World Series. True. So there's Crazy. two ways you can look at it. There's two ways you can look at it here. I'm- but I mean, I, I, what I, what I, my thing is Ricky just, it seemed like he was developing a culture of whatever it takes to win and leave the selfish shit at home. And that's what I think it's missing. At the end of the day, you can go get dudes and studs, but char- there's no staff of character. You got to get dudes who literally care about one thing, and that's appreciating what it takes to, to get a win in the big leagues. And I think Ricky, Ricky Ritzeria, he exuded that, and they didn't, they didn't value it. They took it for granted. All right, so before we move on to Hot Corner, Cam, I do want to get your take on Tommy Pham. Go as, as long or as short as you want on this, but Tommy just signed. We are you know weeks into the season at this point. You mentioned the C-word collusion. Kike Hernandez mentioned it on our show. So did three or four other dudes. What's your take on why players like this can't get signed? They get calls at the same exact time with the same exact offers. Then they disappear, and it's an ongoing game. And we've had, what, probably five to ten free agents on that have said the same exact mm-hmm. thing. I get a call. Everybody calls on December 10th. They offer the same thing. I say no. Then they all hang up. Then they call again on January 20th. It's a lower offer. Then they hang up. What's your take? Well, well the take is – you know, there was a point in time, at least for me, that I appreciate being a part of the game early in my career, um, being being that even the, the losing teams that I, that I was on, the organization tried to put the best losing team out on the field that they could possibly put out there, meaning a team that the fans could also go, hey, I know we aren't that great, but, man, on paper, this team might compete, whether it was your veteran guys. Uh, for example, I was in San Diego one year, and it was towards the end of their career. I had Mark Kotze. I had Jason Bartlett. I had Orlando Hudson. I had Carlos Quentin. 
there were some older guys when you look at that on paper and you put them around Aaron Harain, Jason Marquis, you go, hey, maybe this team compete. It wasn't just like, hey, we don't care about uh, losing. We're just going to give that young guy his league minimum, and we hope he does well. If he does well, it's a plus, and we'll take the loss. We don't care about competing. There was a time in the game where teams actually wanted to compete, even if they were going to be at the bottom of the barrel, using this White Sox you know, team as an example. But for the older guys that are in a certain tier, once you pass that superstar window and you're just a very qual- uh, quality, serviceable guy, that fourth outfield guy, that utility guy, those guys used to get big league jobs. They knew going into the offseason, hey, I'm going to get a big league job. And when you look at Tommy Pham, just look at what he's done in the playoffs the last few years since 2016. I mean, dude, 1,000 OPS, 985 OPS. I mean, in 2019, 858. The dude comes through, and he and he sets a mentality, a focus of, hey, lock it in. I'm here to win. I'm here to get my money, but I want to win. That's how you get paid is by winning. So I think – when you look at that, teams don't care about competing. They don't care about winning. You know, I look at it as an example when I talk about collusion. In 2019, I went to the Yankees as a fourth outfielder, pretty much on a 10-day contract, which was like the craziest thing ever. Filling in for Aaron Judge, I, I play well. That year, less than 250 at-bats or something like that, around 250 at-bats, I hit 284 with 12 homers, 48 stakes, 50 runs, something along those lines, and I had 22 minor league offers. And that's in New York. That's that's my 10th year service time in New York where they say, if you can play in New York, you can play anywhere. And I had 22 minor league offers, not one big league offer. So it's, it was one of those things where no face, no name, resume, I should make 6 to $7 million when you talk about just the, the, the what I was able to do, the, the resume, the amount of service time. But when you get into that tier of, hey, he's not the superstar guy, do we pay him five to six, or do we just go get another guy who's young, who will be happy to be in the big leagues? We're probably going to ruin his confidence because that happens as well. But who cares? We'll just do it to the next one, and we save money. So it's a it's a real thing. So I'm glad these guys are speaking up, and it's really only happening to the veteran guys. JD, like how, how did JD Martinez not sign early? Give me a break. How did Justin Turner not Justin Turner not sign early? Give me a break. It, it's a joke. So it's a it's just teams don't really care if they compete. It's either we're going to be in contention. Or we're not, and there's no in between anymore. True, that's what I've been saying. There's like ten teams that try, and the rest are just like, eh. Absolutely. Used to be, it used to always be, hey, every team is trying at least to get to 500. Like, mm-hmm. hey, if we can get to 500, you know, our fans will be like, we're kind of in it. You know, if we're there, we can make a trade or whatever. But now it's like teams at the jump are like, yeah, we don't really care if we lose 120 games. But just say a rebuild, and you know, GMs are like, it buys me five more years as a rebuilder. <laughs> Well, so, what did they say to you, Cam? Like when you get 22 minor league offers coming off of 127 OPS plus, which is an exceptional number for hitting, right? In 269 plate appearances. And they say, hey, you're a minor leaguer. D- did you or your agency say, why? Yeah, I ended up firing my agency that year because apparently, again, this is also too, for, for the younger guys out there, don't go with just the big name group. Go with who fits you. And I, and I like to call them representatives instead of agents because they represent your morals, your values, your goals, your vision. If you're like a small time guy, you, not, you don't like to be around a lot of people and you're kind of, you know, simple and, and, and low maintenance, you probably don't need a huge group. And I think I got stuck with a group that also at the time, you know, when it came to find out the guy that I thought was negotiating for me, the guy that I'm talking to every day, he really wasn't even the guy going back talking to the teams and pretty much letting teams know yeah, it'll be cool. And, you know, so it comes, it came to a point where the word was out and I would take a minor league deal where, where now I had to go switch agents to a guy that's like, absolutely not. And it was just a fight. So also too, be very aware of your representation when you, when you go into these negotiation situations, because that means a lot. And, and being, and being with somebody who's going to be transparent about the communication, uh, you know, between the team and, and your business. No, that's a good call. It's a good call. It's great to get your perspective there because we've talked about it a lot this off season. All right, let's spice it up. We we need a little hot corner action. <laughs> that was just hot corner, wasn't it? It was. Oh yeah. Give the people what they want, and what they want is Angel Hernandez out of Major League Baseball oh my gosh. because he is stealing the show every weekend. It's not even weekdays. Every weekend he dominates social media. It doesn't matter what's going on. He can't even overtake a theft, bank fraud, blah, 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 betting scandal with 
Shohei Otani's interpreter. He's the top player in the freaking world. And Angel Hernandez still is trending over all of that. <laughs> so here we go. Did you, Because this takes it to another level now. And there were a couple questions online saying, catchers are game planning for this, right, AJ? I mean, uh, he, he totally worked Wyatt Langford. So but the if you're setting you up, aren't you just setting up like this? But and the going, problem is you can't, you, can't, you can't because you never know which angel you're getting, right, Kratzy? Like, you can be like, oh, Angel's really tight today. He won't call anything. And then there's a day, like, who was it that said he had or did her reservations? I think it was the the, <laughs> oh, the Rangers. Doug Eddings. Ron Washington. Doug Eddings. Ron Washington called Doug yeah. Eddings out for having a dinner reservation. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, but somebody uh, somebody in the Astro Rangers game said that about Angel. He has dinner reservations. I think it was the Rangers wow. announcers. But, yeah, I mean, sometimes you just don't know with Angel. Some days yes. it would be super tight. That's- and the next day it would be like this. My favorite was, was Schwarber. Remember when he got thrown out by Schwarber and he threw oh. the bat and he goes, they know you suck. We know you suck. The whole stadium knows you suck. Right? And it was like it was on Sunday Night Baseball. Hater punched him out. Like, that was great. And I, listen, I saw I – I was obviously at the game on Saturday, and I went into the Rangers clubhouse, and I talked to Langford, and I said, man, you, you're a better man than I am. He's no. like, what do you mean? I go, dude, I would have been ejected so fast. He's like, what can I say? He's like, I couldn't even reach those pitches. I was like – a better man than me, brother. Because he's a rookie, he can't say he doesn't feel like he can. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't care about a rookie. My first game in the big leagues, I get rung out of pitch seven inches off the plate. We got problems. Six point two four inches off the plate. You cannot like it was the largest missed pitch on either side of the plate since they've started tracking pitches, and that's AJ already hit on it. You can't game plan. You, you game plan for a guy who has a zone that's consistently low, consistently tight, consistent. Like, you can game plan for that kind of thing. You cannot game – like, yes, the catcher who was – I forget who was behind a dish, if it was if it was Caratini or Diaz. You get that pitch. You get six inches off. Yes, awesome. The next day you're getting .99 – points on your on your schedule that's not good because that means he's going to miss pitches that are right down the middle too which he did the week before with Trevino catching (laughs) like you can't you, you cannot game plan for something like that but at some point when it's that egregious and I said this before somebody in MLB has to step up just to make sure we're being competitive in baseball yeah, I want to ask a question to – I got a question for you two. Two, two questions. One, because I always wonder, and people at home don't know this about – you know, and we see Angel, I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's bad. I mean, constantly. But what I always wonder from the catchers, people don't know, like, Angel, he comes off as this really nice guy before the, hey, what's up, buddy? How's the family doing? What's going on? It's like, you know, how did you guys handle that behind the plate? Did y'all just go, hey, Angel, just go, just stop it, cut it out right there? Like, just leave that alone. Let's not even try to act like we're cool because we know you're going to screw me at some point in this game. And then, two, <laughs> C.B. Buckner, Angel, uh, Laz, who who would you guys, if you had to have, who, like, if one of them, you had to, one of them got to go, who, who is it? Who's the worst of them all? Man, C.B. C.B. was the worst. I got to act right, crack, crack, because people talk about Angel, but C.B., man, no. it's. C.B. was the worst. And the whole angel, like, nice guy thing, for years, I was always like, you know, oh, hey, you know, God bless you. How's your family? And I hate, like, I hate small talk. Like, if I'm going to be like, hey, how's your day? Like, I don't want you to be like, oh, good, just blessed. Oh, okay, so why is it blessed? Uh, you mean I have to, like, <laughs> expound on that? And I did that. I, I said that one day, and he was like, uh, so I don't know if he's a nice guy or not because I, you, you don't get to know his personality at all when he's out there. Mm. I loved Laz. Laz and awesome. I, I loved Laz and I loved uh, – um, I'm thinking Lance Barrett, but it's not Lance Barrett. Uh, I did like Lance. He just retired last year. Big old – we had him on the show even. Bro, was Teddy it Brian? Barrett. Teddy Barrett. Oh, Teddy, Teddy Barrett. Barrett. Both, yeah, all Teddy's those guys, good. all those guys were in the top, in the bottom five for scores for, for uh, numbers. 
behind the plate. They would miss they would miss calls, three calls here, three calls there, six calls here. It's how you handled it. It's how you communicate with the guys, with the with the catcher, with the umpire. And I felt like CB and, and Angel, they couldn't communicate. There was no like connection there where you're like, okay, I feel it. You're working with me. Ah, oh, you missed one. That's okay. Like we're here together. Yeah. I just always wondered. I appreciate that. I, I, always, I, I never had a problem with Angel, surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, but he's getting worse. I, I think he is now. I never really had a problem with Angel. The only time I had a problem with Angel is when they called Burley for a balk and Joe West called him for a balk. And he picked off Joe. And then the next time they kicked Burley out, remember he threw his glove up in the air and he threw he, he oh, yeah. out of the game in Cleveland yeah. and Ozzy came charging out. Well, the next time we had on that crew was Angel and Joe West. So the yeah. next time Burley pitched, like, I don't know, a couple times down the road, we had that crew again, and we're like, and I'm like, Bert, Mark, if you throw over, dude, they're gonna call a balk. Just no. And some fast guy got over there. Mark had a great pick on move. He pick off everybody. Mm-hmm. And he gets over there, and Ozzy calls throw over, and I'm like, oh boy, call throw over, and he gives like the worst move in the history of the world. And I think Joe was at third, and Angel was behind the plate, or whatever it was. And as soon as he picked up his leg and went to first, Angel's like, balk, and we're like. <laughs> That was the – like, literally, he, like, did the most deliberate, like, I'm going to first move just to see. Bop! And I'm like, Angel. So they just targeted him. They targeted him. Yeah. 100 yes. million percent. They tar- and, the, and Angel did it to back up Joe West because yep. he called a balk on him last time. So Angel's like, watch this. I'm going to show everybody. And we, we were just – We were laughing. Friend, Joe. We were just laughing. Friend. And we laughed about it because we knew. I'm like, if you throw over, they're going to – first one, they're going to – and he literally did the dumbest. He was like, I'm coming over. Woo. Like – in there pip, bop, right away yeah see that's where the game has to change like you're actually rigging the game you're not necessarily taking money for it but you're rigging the game if you're doing that if you're telling your buddies oh i'm gonna have your back i'm just gonna call it whatever you the game is now rigged so i do think we're at a point with angel where the game is getting rigged one day it's down the middle it's a ball the next day it's six and a half inches off the plate it's a strike to me he's not going to blow every single call but he's doing just enough to take over and piss off the world and yet still have a job. It's really bad. Let's go to the call too that AJ was referring to on the Rangers broadcast. Bike zone. Whoa. Yeah, this, this is a shame right here. This pitch is well off the plate. <laughs> Two one. And oh my goodness. What in the world? My goodness. Are we trying? Two two. You have oh. got to be kidding me this is just bad three consecutive pitches well off the plate catchers having to move the glove back a foot to try to frame that that's my dude dave valley i mean guys he has to turn his head this way to see the pitch he has to turn his head to his right to see the pitch finish Listen, it used to be a thing when you were rookie, Cam. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, like, it used to be a thing. Like, you would get screwed by umpires. Mm-hmm. And they would tell you, like, they'd tell you, like, all right, look, you're a rookie, dude. You got a veteran. You got some 10-year vet out there. And you'd get one a couple inches off the plate, and they'd be like, you'll you'll get it eventually. But nowadays with the, the electronic stuff, they're not supposed to be able to do it. But certain people still do it and get away with it. What's funny is you look at this scorecard, and it says plus two runs for Houston – and Houston got their asses kicked in that game. They did. But still, it like, could have been two more runs. And also, he was 78% called strikes. 78% accurate. Ugh. You can't do that. You just can't do that. He, he's not a big league umpire anymore. Whether he's doing what it on the- purpose or not, Cam. It, it, you can't do it anymore. Like I can't believe we still have to talk about this. There has to be a way. The commissioner has so much power, yet he can't do anything, nothing, to get rid of a problem. What's the line? Should, should Angel eventually go into a game and call every ball a strike and every strike a ball? Then will we do something? You know, this is what bothers me the most, what we're not talking about. And, I mean, we live in the, the day and age of YouTube. It, it's every, Everything's on social media. It's recorded. We're only talking about how bad he's been behind the dish. Dude misses, misses stuff in the field all the time as well. We, we, it's not like he's just struggling behind the plate. Let's how many how many controversial calls like the ball that the AJ just alluded to, but there are calls constantly throughout the year in the field where he's messing up. And like you said, it, it can affect the game, honestly. And I'll tell you where it affects the game is, you know, we talk about the mental aspect of it. Now with the game being sped up, 
Angel makes a bad call. Now a guy is all in his head. He's all frustrated. So now I have to calm myself down in the game that we try to speed up. So now I'm all discombobulated because I'm worried about this guy behind the plate if he can do his job right. So people don't even understand the element from a mental standpoint. They say the game is, you know, 80% mental, 20% physical. Well, there you go. You have somebody messing with my mental in a game that's already difficult enough. So I, I think, yeah. you know, I don't, at some point they've got to figure something out. You, you might have some envelopes or something somewhere, but we got to get Angel up out of there. Yeah, just pay him. Pay him to go away. It's it's such a stain on the sport at this point. It's like all people can talk about all weekend. We have 30 things to address. All people can talk about all weekend. And you're getting like all walks of baseball personalities. It's not just fans anymore. It's insiders. It's former GMs like our, our buddy Bowden. Undoubtedly, MLB needs to address the lapse of judgment of this level from an umpire. Embarrassing to the sport. Everyone is saying it. Everyone. I at least want an answer from someone with the league saying, hey, this is being addressed. We have to talk to him about it. Like, give me something. The silence, what is it? Silence is deafening or whatever. Mm-hmm. That You can't do nothing at this they point. They can't do anything, though. That's the problem because of the union. They can't do anything. Then plus, speak. Say that. Plus, say that. Plus, Put it on he, them. Plus, plus, he already sued the league. That's say that. Big. Say all that. That's the big part, that he sued the league, so they feel like they're going to have to pay him off if he gets let go? Like, What does that have to do with performance, though? Yeah, but Sky, yeah, you made a good point though. People, it, 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 it gets bad when people that don't even watch baseball. And again, you're on X, I'm on Twitter, and I see people going, I don't even watch baseball, and that's horrible. I'm not even a baseball fan, and that's <laughs> atrocious. Like, that's when it's becoming a problem, like you said, when outsiders are starting to recognize what's going on as well. It's, it's an issue. Yep, exactly. All right, well, we'll keep talking about it. Someone's got to do it. Let's, let's move to happier times. <laughs> Shohei Otani had the home run ball controversy, and it wasn't his fault. I mean, the fan that caught the baseball seemed like a genuine, excited fan and felt like it was a weird situation. She got separated from her significant other, and they said they wouldn't authenticate the baseball, whatever. It does sound like, Kratz, we have a happy ending. I know you're all about this, where you see on the weekend, she gets to meet Otani. They give her a bunch of signs stuff like very easy to fix a problem because it's a huge organization in my mind maybe a security guard or two we're not doing things correctly and the Dodgers fixed it from what I saw they they bring her back for her birthday and just absolutely brought all the VIPness to it that's exactly what a big league organization needs to do I think when when you talk about all the Dodgers they 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 you know they strong-armed her they got her away from her husband and you know they wouldn't authenticate it how much of that was true? How much of that was the people that were taking care of things? People that have to take care of the players and things around the players, they're very seldom like real like, oh, you know, roses roses and rainbows. They're like, hey, we're going to get this done and we have to do it. So can they be a little bit more strong arming or perceived as strong arming? But the organization did a great job stepping back and – the pictures that they had, if you look it up, the pictures of her getting pictures with Otani, her and her husband with Otani, signed bat. And I think there were some more people there for her birthday. To me, I think the Dodgers handled this really, really well. It was a bad piece of publicity that turned into something awesome. And I don't think players, obviously, I never really hit any, like, big home runs that like I needed the ball back. Everyone was like, yeah, he can have his ball back and whatever. I don't really need anything. It was something that I think the org did a great job. And I don't think Otani's like, Oh, I can't believe I had to do that. Beautifully stated. They fixed it. That's it. They they fixed it. They fixed a problem that shouldn't have been a problem from the get go, but. But yeah, I mean, you could, you could have a rogue employee, employee, though. You could have, you know, an employee that didn't yeah. handle it right. They can't be yeah. in charge of every no, second. And it so. didn't need to be a problem. It should have been like, hey, whatever you want. You know, it's cool. you're the fan. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Like we'll figure it out. But she got it. She got right in the end. And you know, I mean, the way they were treating her, I would have been like, yeah, here's the ball. Puh! Pour my <laughs> coke over and been like, right? Like, you, you know what I'm saying? It. Like, Puh! here you go. Authenticate, authenticate it. Authenticate <laughs> yeah. it with his peanut, peanut crumb. 
<laughs> I mean, seriously, like I would have taken ketchup and go, no, you want to authenticate it. You can't do that. I know, but like the way, the, but they're like separated her from her husband. No, that's, that's why I like, did weird. all these, we're not going to authenticate it. I would have been like, okay, then I'll just keep it. Right. That's it. I just would have said, cool, I'm keeping it. I'm going to, actually the way to solve this stuff nowadays, and sometimes it's annoying, but this is actually the time to do it, is you just record your life. As soon as Boom. you catch that baseball, you, hmm. you hold the ball with your life and you just press record. Look how things will change. Oh, yeah. I've done it a couple times in life. There was a, I had a dispute in an apartment once where they're doing construction at two in the morning and denying it during the day. I was in Miami. I said, cool. I just went downstairs, took my phone and said, hey guys, I'm just going to stand here. Cool. Yeah, it probably wasn't the best move. They probably, <laughs> they probably still have my name on a hit list, which we're going to get to in a sec. But anyway, the point <laughs> is if, if, if she recorded the entire time, Either it would have played out differently or they would have fixed the problem, you know, that second, right? Okay, now you have your authentication. Here it is. I'm never freaking leaving. And look what they're doing. They're separating me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, unfortunately, that is a way that you can. You know, all you got to do is hit uh, Twitter, whoop, Instagram. That was, my exact, that was my exact thought, Scott. I was literally like, yo, get the phone out. Who needs the authenticator? I got your authentication right here. And all these people yep. around me, hey, hey, here we go, hey. hey. Now and you just keep, you keep it there. Like AJ said, you want your ball? Now you come. Hey, you you DM me. Find find me on on the internet. You come to my house and get this ball. <laughs> exactly. Because you you could record for an hour until it gets fixed. It would get fixed if you say, "Hey, I've been recording the whole thing." Just so you know, I'm holding this baseball. You better authenticate it. It would get authenticated. I guarantee it. So, all right. On that topic, let's get to the latest update here on Ipe Mizuhara since we last broke. From the show over the weekend he turned himself in sam blum's done a great job with the athletic covering this story so ipe appeared in court with shackles around his ankles that were later taken off he's released on twenty five thousand dollar bond along with numerous conditions he cannot leave central district district of california without permission he cannot contact shohei otani and it has to do oh and he has to do a gambler's addiction program he did not enter a plea his arraignment hearing is scheduled for may 9th at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. I think he still could do a plea agreement. I think they just didn't figure that out yet is what I got. I'm not going to try and play No, when you insider. first go in, you don't – that was a bond hearing. Right. So that's – was was he going to be a bail, right? So is he going to be allowed bail? Okay. And I mean, and then you enter a plea when you go to the arraignment. So you go to the arraignment and you say, Mr. Braun, do you plead guilty or not guilty to taping someone at 2 a.m. doing construction? Your answer <laughs> is – Guilty. Okay, I, well then I boom. recorded it. Sentenced. I recorded You're sentenced it. sentenced to life as a Miami Hurricane fan. So wait, he says, so what did he say there? Not guilty? No, he didn't say anything. Oh, he just say nothing. Right. In the bail hearing, you just sit there and they yeah. say, is he, a, is he a flight risk? Is he going to leave? Yep. You know, what can he, you know, they try to put one at work, something he can't afford. But, I mean, apparently he had $16 million in a bank account somewhere. Twenty five grand do not seem like that much. Mm -mm. Exactly. Um, we have, <laughs> we have one piece of the story that that I kind of missed first time around that I wanted to bring back here. Britt Giroli actually retweeted it. That's how I found it. So and th there was a, a fan on, on Twitter who said, we were not too far away from Otani getting his kneecaps taken out. Like <laughs> half kidding, half not. So, you know, there were there was 37 pages in that document. And one said on or about November 17, 2023, because they had tons of, of texts and phone calls from the banks and the back and forth between Ipe and the dude running the bookie um, scheme. Quote, here's the text that, that the bookie sent to Ipe. Hey, Ipe, it's two o'clock on Friday. I don't know why you're not returning my calls. I'm here in Newport Beach and I see victim A, which is Otani, walking his dog. I'm just going to go up and talk to him and ask how I can get in touch with you since you're not responding. Please call me back immediately. Did I not say the whole time? When you're, when you're messing around like this, what did I say, Kratz? This is mob shit. This is mob shit. Big facts. This is this is definitely some mafia mob type shit. I mean, you couldn't go find you a safe bookie. I mean, damn. Mob shit. This is big money. Crazy. This is a massive, massive ring that was taken down just now. It, it gets to the point. Here's the seriousness part, where AJ Otani could have been in danger. No joke. You don't know who you're messing with. Like they could have taken his dog too. Yeah. No, they could have. What's his name? Decoy. Decoy. Maybe that's why his name Decoy. Oh, he'd let Decoy, he'd let decoy, decoy go me. and he'd run the other way. <laughs> no, it, it, it's scary that he was that far deep, man. I mean, you think about it. You think about that type of money. I mean, people. 
you know, ha have lost their life for less. You know, for sure. It, it definitely could have been way more serious than, than we know. A lot of people don't care about clout, status, who you are. You know, you can't play with people's money like that, man. That's uh, it is more serious than I think a lot of us actually realize. I mean, we knew it was serious, but we talk, start talking about, you know, possibly somebody's life being in danger. It's it's uh, it's just no joke. All right, so Cam, let me ask you this. It, 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 I mean, if you're down forty million dollars to somebody, forty million dollars to somebody, mm -hmm. and they call you, you're probably calling them back, right? What I'm picking up, or or, or I'm a running, on island, or I'm on the island. Or you're running. Jet. I'm gonna take that sixteen million and get me a jet and, and go ahead and get up out of here and, and see if I can find me an island somewhere to post up. But yeah, it's <laughs> absolutely running like fours. <laughs> 40, 40 million. million. He was 40 down 40 million. million. 40 million dollars. 40,000. They're breaking somebody's kneecaps. Absolutely. 40 million get a whole family taken out. They yeah. take out they take out the best player in baseball, Shohei Otani. <laughs> facts, big facts. That's what I'm saying. Crazy. You got to be careful. I mean, he didn't just steal from his friend, tarnish reputations left and right, you know? This dangerous. is bigger than all of that. This gets exactly. to be dangerous. It still, it still, it still begs the question that nobody has answered yet, and we need to maybe hear from the bookie at some point. Yeah. How did Ipe get a forty million dollar line of credit, making two hundred grand? Yeah, that's, that's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. Like, yeah. At what point, I'm, bookie? Do you? At what point do we get to like a million? And like, and the bookie's like, hey, bud, you owe me a million. You can't place any more bets until you get my million back. Like, what are, we, like what are we? What are we? What are we doing? He won 142 million. I know he lost 180, but this wasn't like, oh man, we just got to 40 million. And and we're talking about just Shohei here. He put everybody that he works with in danger. Like that's the seriousness of this mm -hmm. because of the peop the people that he was or or the the actions that he was taking. Everybody around him was in danger. I mean, it's just, it's just the whole, the numbers thing. Like, how much was this dude betting per game? Um, right. It was 26, an average of 26 bets per day, and the average bet was in the 12K range. And I know if I'm like a penny off, the YouTube yep. comments no, are going to no. go, no, 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 close no, enough. No, no. You're close. So this dude's betting 12K a game, making 200 grand a game he a was, year. His average, his average per day winnings. Was one hundred and ninety four thousand dollars his average per day? Yeah, but how much? That I means he was losing how much? His average was two hundred and fifty thousand six hundred and two dollars, if you want to be exact. And I based it on two years of mm. of gambling. Is is what is what the report said? Two years. That is one crazy. Worst, one of the worst predictors of all time. Like you, you would go up to him and say, "Hey, dude, is it gonna rain today?" And he would say, "No," and then it would start pouring like instantly. Yeah, instantly. He was he was that bad. Crazy. Uh, anyway, more on this story with Ken Rosenthal's fair territory. Yeah. Check it out later on today. It was uh, run as a premiere earlier on the FT YouTube network. There's Kenny Ball game going over the whole deal, also going over injuries. And we'll get to that later. Dude, too. I just spend a whole weekend with him. Uh, I can't wait. I, I've so saved lucky. some time later for slap hands to get some Ken Rosenthal stories. Oh, my gosh, so, dude. I had, I had to spend the – and then I had to ride to the airport with him Saturday. And it, uh, I, I'll tell you guys a great story at the end. But, oh, my gosh. I think you can tell it now because the next topic is going to take a little time and we have a guest coming up. So, okay. So do it. So, uh, obviously, I did the game with Ken on Saturday in, in Houston. And, you know, he's sitting there and – not kept every inning. Uh, we were like, we kept throwing it to Ken, and I'm like, why does Ken? Why do we throw it to Ken every inning? I don't every understand. inning, like it was like the first five innings. And I'm like, and I said to our, you know, you hit your producer. I'm like, why are we? Why do we keep throwing it to Ken? I don't understand. And he's like, because he threw you under the bus on foul on foul, foul territory on Friday, so we're going to show you. And I was like, <laughs> damn it! <laughs> right. So this was literally. This is like. This is like Angel like, Hernandez backing up Joe West. It, yeah. You guys were talking shit, and they were like, you know what? We can do this. We can put Ken on every Yeah, day. we can put him on every time. <laughs> and then, So then we're driving. We're trying to go to the airport. We had kind of tight flights going to the Houston airport. Ken and I were on similar flight schedules. And uh, 
the the guy who was supposed to pick us up, they're normally there in like the fifth inning, sitting there waiting for you. We couldn't find the guy. And Ken's like, do you speak Spanish? He was going around going, do you speak Spanish? Because the guy, he was calling him, and the guy didn't speak English at all, only Spanish. And Ken doesn't speak Spanish very well. And he's literally going around, can, can, does anybody speak in a good, and they're, and they're like, I don't understand. Ken, Google Translate. Dude, I'll, it was I'll, unbelievable. I gotta teach him but the guy couldn't it. figure out where we were. And I'm like, Ken, send him a pin. He's like, I don't want to send this guy in my location. I'm like, well, eventually we're going to miss our plane. And we ended up getting a ride from someone else. But poor Ken, man, he had a rough, he had a rough Saturday. Whew. Whew. This is and why he doesn't work with the B group. This is why he doesn't work right? with AJ. Yeah. This is he's an A guy. He is an A Fox guy. And when he heard it was it was gonna be the JV AJ Przinsky show, he's like, nope, can't do it. And then he showed up. So then on Saturday we were going to get we're going to our we have our you know I think it was ten thirty a.m. pickup on Saturday. And I was down there ten twenty five and I'm checking out and you know the, a little bit slow short Saturday morning a little short staff. And he's like this, standing there going. <laughs> On I'm you. like, Ken, it's 1029, bro. He's like, ah, ah. we're going to be late. We're going to be late. I'm like, Ken, hey. we're not going to be late. It's a five-second ride to the park. <laughs> he's very prompt. Oh, man. Uh, we'll talk to Ken, I think, tomorrow. So oh. let's step aside for a sec, and then we'll bring in our next guest right after this. Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of Foul Territory. Unified Healing is an innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. This technology <laughs> promotes wellness and deep relaxation, and there are hundreds of locations across the globe. Interested in experiencing the EE System technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash foul to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash F-O-U-L. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. All right, so we're about to bring in Dave Sims to talk Mariners ball. We'll get back to some Jackie Robinson Day conversation as well. Real quick, Cam, because we've talked about them a lot, of course, over the past several months. How are you feeling about the Mariners? Like, Do you feel like they did enough this offseason? What do you think about their lineup specifically? I think most people should feel okay about their starting pitching as long as they stay on the field. Yeah, yeah, their pitching is is what they needed to be. I'm okay with their bullpen, but I, I – I personally think they've had a tough time getting that big bat the last few years. And, again, I spoke about J.D. Martinez earlier, um, a veteran guy that I think brings still a lot of quality. And when you talk about offensively, I think it helps some of those young hitters. I think he would have been great for uh, uh, J-Rod out there in Seattle. Uh, but I do like what I'm seeing out of Crawford, his, his growth as a hitter, starting to you know swing for more power, more pop. Um, Ty Francis, I think, is who he is, you, you know, as far as the hitter goes. He's, he's pretty consistent. But I do think um, losing, again, I know this sounds crazy because people don't realize it, but Teoscar Hernandez finished up pretty strong at the end, coming on pretty late. And I think that's why the Dodgers were so interested. Um, but I think they, they're they still missing some, some, some quality at bat, some quality hitters. Um, and, and right now with the way that division is trending I think they'll be in the mix because of their starting pitching if they can stay healthy but I still think you know they're going to have to scrape and, and scratch for runs and figure out ways to manufacture runs and win the close ball game they're going to rely more on their pitching than their offense I think right now let's see if Dave Sims agrees with you great Mariners broadcaster of course call games all over uh, many sports and Dave great to have you on love the hat as well. well we'll do Mariners your reaction here quick and then we'll get to some Jackie talk too but what do you think well, I, I think Cam makes some good points, and, and right now nobody's really hitting. I mean, it's all about the pitching. Pitching the last few days has been really good. Uh, Luis uh, Castillo didn't get a win yesterday, but it was probably one of his better performances. Um, and before that, Hancock, he took a loss, but he was improved. Um, let's see, uh, Bryce Miller has been outstanding in his last uh, outing, and same with Logan Gilbert. But, yeah, it's about offense right now. In the top of the order, uh, they've been running out uh, J.P., uh, Julio and Polanco, and they've just been scuffling big time. And, and then yesterday, uh, you know, Julio comes in the game as a pinch runner late and gets picked off for the third out ends the game. That was uh, that was unfortunate, to put it mildly. And uh, they've gone one for 15 runners in scoring position the last two games, losing two out of three to, to the Cubs. So 
it's all about the pitching, but you got to have, we got generally these last three years in this open window where the guys are really, you know, vying for playoff spots and, and going deep in the playoffs. It, it you know, it, it the, the hitting's just got to pick up, and I think it will. Dave, I, I got to ask you, what was your call last night when, when Julio got picked off? Was it like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was on radio. <laughs> Rick had the Rick Riz had the call, but yeah, yeah, I, believe me. Uh, I, thankfully my mic was muted at that time. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, and then when, uh, uh, we were talking about it, waiting for, you know, the, uh, the right thing to do, obviously council, you know, appealed it and, and as for a review and we we're saying, this could be like the worst thing you could see to end a ball game. And that's exactly what happened. I've never seen or heard of a game ending like that. Uh, you know, with the chance he got a big bopper up there in Rayleigh, who's, Who's due for a big home run? Due for a big hit? He hit the ball hard uh, to a double play at 106 miles an hour. I mean, we had three double plays yesterday. Just, just killed him. But uh, yeah, that that was a tough way to end the ball game. Trust me. Hey, so, did you agree? Because I saw then he declined to speak to the media after the game. Do you agree with that? Or I mean, I understand it's tough, but I it's mean, a big you are the, No, I hear you. It's you are you I are the super you. you are the superstar, right, of the team? Yeah, and no, and, I, and everyone loves Julio, and not only in Seattle but all over MLB. He's a great kid, no doubt. But do you think you should have just been like, I made a mistake, and boom, it's over? Hey, that's you know that's the best way to deal with the situation. Yeah, screwed up. I mean, it's easy for me to say, and and, and well, I'm married forty two years. So I've said that a few times. Um, <laughs> yeah, I screwed up. I was wrong, and uh, hey. I won't do it again. I mean, and, and that just just face the music. Um, I, I, that, that'd be my preference, no question about it. Yeah, we, we've seen that at, at a larger stage. Colton Wong got picked off the end of World <laughs> Series game, and Remember he that? stood there and he's like, "Yeah, I don't know what to say." <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a young kid too. Yeah, he was a rookie. He got yeah, he got picked off. Yeah. Remember, uh, Ko, Koji Uihara picked him off at the end of right. the games of the World Series. Like that was. And he, he was like, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I fucked up. <laughs> that usually covers yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Cam or EK, you up? Yeah, yeah. Sam's it's good to see you, my guy. Always, hey, man. man. Hey, that's it. Good to all I of you guys. Say, man, I, I appreciate you. Why again? We're giving flowers out today. This guy, you know, has been. It was huge for me getting into this broadcast world. So I appreciate everything. But why, why have you? We're talking about identities of a team. And we know, you know, a big part of the identity is that pitching staff. Um, you, you know, you can only rely on that so much, though. You have to find a way to manufacture some runs, right? These guys don't need much. So what are you hearing around the clubhouse, around the park, as far as, you know, what they're trying to do as a team, their identity? Uh, you know, they're not, you know, not. it's a big park. It's not the most hitter-friendly park, but, you know, getting hitters in there that understand their game, understand how to manufacture runs. Because I think last year we saw that with Teoscar, a lot of guys, the field can affect their approach. Or what are they talking about as far as an approach goes? Hey, we know we love the long ball, but is it a base hit? Use the athleticism. Yeah. Of approach? Yeah. Well, that, you know, the, the granted was spring training, but coming down the stretch in spring training, they were putting the ball in play with regularity and scoring runs. And one player told me, he says, hey, we might have peaked too soon. I said, we're going to have to peak again soon because this is not happening right now. They know that. We're not telling you. know, We're not breaking new ground here. Um, put the ball in play. That's been a really strong theme uh, from the coaching staff. The home runs will happen. And when you have opportunities, and there have been multiple opportunities in this first, uh, what, how many games we played, 15, 16 games, and they just haven't cashed in yet. And it's also, keep in mind, too, I think this is something like the fourth year where the start has not exactly been secretary coming out of the gate. And and they've, they've rallied to, you know, get in contention. And here's the other thing, too, I think you guys even mentioned before you brought me on. Um, nobody's running away with it at this moment uh, in the division. So there's still plenty of time. There, there's hardly time. This is not a time to be panicking or anything. You don't want to be throwing a grenade in the in the clubhouse. I mean, you're not going to blow the whole thing up. I mean, come on, take it easy. It's baseball. You guys have been through it. You lived it as players. I've lived it as a as a media person for a very for many decades now. So, and, you know, it's April fifteenth. Hey, man, let's enjoy Jackie Robinson Day, and uh, then we'll go get them. Go after them tonight against Cincinnati. Well, before let's we do that. Jack- oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I just before we hit the Jackie Robinson Day celebration. Mitch Hanniger, is were you able to see him 
before this year, not when he was a Mariner. And is there a difference or is it like, hey, this Mitch Haniger is the Mitch Haniger we remember. He puts on that uniform and he gets to raise the trident. Like, is this is this going to be a guy that's going to possibly carry this team for a month like he used to before there wasn't superstars here? Yeah, well, we can go back and look at the numbers. The two years he played 157 games, he put up ridiculous numbers. I think the one year he had 39 homers and like 100 plus mm-hmm. ribbies. Another year he went for like 26 and 90 something. If we get that kind of, if they get that kind of uh, Mitch Haniger, I think they're gonna, you know, things are gonna work out real well. And, you know, he'll be in the four or five spot, uh, and he's playing a good outfield. They're gonna really, you know, do a good job of not overplaying him. You know, give him a rest every now and I mean, he's, you know, he's he's not on crutches by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, you want to have him through the course of the season and into the playoffs. But I, he's a good player, man, and he's healthy. His his whole thing, and I know I said this, I even said it to him. I said, man, I wish we could wrap you in bubble wrap because you've had so many unlucky type of types of injuries during the course of your career. So I, I, the confidence in Mitch Tanniger is running very high. All right, you're wearing the, the hat, 42, and today is the day. It's Jackie Robinson Day every single April 15th. You know, give me something interesting that, that stands out to you on a day like today. You know, obviously you've been in this game for a long time now, um, and how Major League Baseball does a great job of, of celebrating Jackie Robinson, making everything about 42. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I wouldn't be here without with the, the accomplishments of Jackie Robinson. I mean, we've all had work, work day lives. And can you imagine going to work every day like, man, I'm going to hear some crap today and I got to put up with it. And I got to excel in a very difficult game and I got to play at the top, of, you know, the highest, to my best of my ability, to the highest degree and represent an entire race. Um, when you think about what that man went through, you know, it, it, it's just mind boggling. Whitey Ashburn told me a story. Uh, what was this back in '84 when I was at NBC Philly and, and uh, we had the World Series that year? And I said, Whitey, what, it's true that you guys were it went after Jackie Robinson hard. I said, Yeah, we were under orders to do this spit on him, spike him, cut him, throw at him, do whatever. And he said, He went to who was it, Ben Chapman, I think, was uh, was the uh, manager at the time. And, and Whitey said, I went to Skip and told him, says, You need to call this off because he is freaking shoving it on us all the freaking time every time we did. The more we get after him. So they, they called it off after a period of time. And I played for a guy that was one of the holler guys that, you know, with, you know, how one of those high, shrill voices. And, you know, the, the bench stocking was at a different level than it is now. And they would be all over him. So my, my respect for Jackie Robinson, what he did for not only for black people, but for the country, too. He's one of the most consequential Americans of the 20th century. Uh, he inspired Dr. King. He was, as Bob Hendrick uh, from the Negro League Museum in the Hall of Fame always talks about, it was Jackie Robinson, then there was Brown versus Board of Education, then there was Dr. King and, and, um, and uh, Rosa Parks, and then, you know, voting rights and all that stuff. So he got all, he got that ball rolling in a country that, you know, everything, you know, everybody's created equal. Well, certainly we got a great country, but it has, was and is a flawed country. We're still great. But he helped turn things around, and I can't begin to tell you how much respect I have for him. And when you look at Major League Baseball and the history of broadcasting, I'm only like the fourth or fifth African American to, to be a, an announcer on on a specific team. I'm not just talking network, but I'm talking about a team. So, yeah, I, I take that, I, I carry that with a lot of pride, and um, I'm very care, uh, very careful, um, and and proud of being in this position. Should we have more? Because I think this is the one day that Major League Baseball just absolutely crushes it. I think they do a great job with the uniforms. I think it's something, I mean, I I do a hat every day. Like, this is a hat that, like, I wear with pride. I almost wore my jersey the one time I got to start on Jackie Robinson Day. Should I do more? Like, all the things you just talked about, should it be a week? Should it be a weekend? Or would that water it down and it wouldn't be so... As, as good as it is. Hey, man, in the history of this country, and you're talking about going back to 16, 19, in the world it's going to uh, be too much. I mean, there's so much time you want to try to make up for in the things that happen in this country. And I, I think I was talking to a good friend of mine, Sal Marciano, great sportscaster in New York, and he said, you know, not only do we, we have a, a 42 day, Jackie Robinson day, we need to have a Henry Aaron day for the accomplishments that he had. We got Lou Gehrig because of the tragic disease that took him out. 
And recently, MLB came up with uh, what a Clemente Day on the tw- was the twenty first of September. So yep. all of these guys have really set the stage for us to enjoy this great game that we love so much. And y- you have to pay homage to them, and you have to continue to tell a story. I, I said it's almost like Passover. That you know, our, our Jewish friends, you know, they tell it that story year in and year out because they have to. And then the same with the Holy Week and, and Christianity. You got to keep pounding that message, and and I think as the younger kids come along, they, you know, they don't have any idea. And I I was born. uh, Jackie Robinson was in like his sixth or seventh year. I never saw him play, but I grew up with my father talking about him all the time. My father was born in 1923, only a couple years after Jack Mister Robinson was born, and to listen to my dad and guys of his black guys of his generation talk about what it meant to them. To see Jackie Robinson, a black guy. I mean, they were rooting for. They, they loved baseball. They rooted for. You know, my father rooted for the A's, rooted for the Yankees, and all that kind of stuff. But to see a black guy, an American uh, black male playing in you know America's pastime, that means a heck of a lot. And and you know, I I've, I've tried to I've passed that along to my kids. Uh, kids are grown grown ass men now, but they they know how I feel about uh, Jackie Robinson, his legacy, and the legacy of all of those that first generation of black guys that came along. Cam, you're not sitting there. I'm not sitting there without those guys, slings and arrows that they had to put up with and achieve at the highest level. You just can't say enough of it. It's such a great story to talk about and, and tell. And I think, and nobody tells it better than Bob Kendrick. Yes, Dave. I won't keep you too too much longer but i think it is important and you you brought up something important to me is educating these young guys because it is a new wave and new generation coming and you know sometimes i wonder if they do know the history like guys like myself guys on this call guys like yourself you know but one thing i can say or i want to ask you can you feel it because i know you're a guy that's you're down on that field all the time can you feel the importance of this day when you're walking around and you see these guys taking the field and they're wearing the 42 because like i said earlier in the in the show you know, I had a year or two where I was on IL, and it hurt me. But can can you see and feel that energy and that appreciation when you're down on the field? Uh, I think I think guys, a lot of guys. <laughs> I think back to something somebody told me. My stage manager she said, "You know, for a lot of these guys, I might be the first black guy that you know." And Cam, you might have been the first black guy a lot of these cats met and, and dealt with. Uh, and I think for them to learn. Uh, this part of American history is is vital, vitally important. And, you know, we love this game, and we're trying to get more African-Americans involved with the game. I, I was told there's only like 47 African-Americans were on opening day rosters. And this is way down from back in the 70s and 80s, where, you know, the, the league, the major leagues had 17 to 20 percent African-American players. They're good guys, too. Good guys, good players. And I think we have to continue to sell how great this game is. Granted, you can't walk off the college. Not everybody's going to walk off a college campus or off a high school lot and walk right into the major leagues. you got to put in your time. It's not like the NBA or the NFL. If you're that, that big a stud, you can walk right in and play on a team. you know, you got to earn it here, and you got to develop your skill. But once you get here, man, it's the best. And they don't call it the show for nothing. So, you know, I, I'm very proactive on, in that regard. I love it when I see – you know, the African-American players and, and, you know, the black and brown Hispanic guys, too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and then also I found out the other day that uh, we had uh, we had Malachi Moore, who's from Compton. He's an umpire. He was in the minors for 10 years. He's only the 10th African-American umpire we've had in the game. I mean, that, that's crazy. I mean, that, that that's all in the history of the game. And so I, I just think we have to broaden our horizons, continue to broaden horizons, to get the black audience back and interested and loving baseball. Because when, as a matter of fact, I saw a picture yesterday, somebody posted on, on social media of Willie Mays making a catch center field. I think it was center field at uh, Ebbets field. And all the people in the bleachers were black. It was unbelievable. It was a regular season game. He was with the, you know, with the giants back in New York. We don't see that kind of crowds. I mean, my, both my grandmothers were, were baseball fans. We don't see those kind of numbers anymore. And something's got to be, either started or fired up and pumped up to get the black America fired up about baseball again. Yeah, it's a good call. I, I have one more for you on that topic for involvement. What about executives? I know, you know, Kenny Williams was very vocal 
um, about you know the lack of progress there. And you know, I think about Dana Brown taking over as GM of the Houston right. Astros. He is behind many of the brilliant moves that the Braves have made in terms of scouting and development over the last whatever it's been that, that he was with Atlanta. And now he comes over to Houston. I just heard a story the other day about him saying, no, guys, we need to give Ronel Blanco a chance to start. I actually think he's got the stuff. Whatever he turns into, it is that what it works. is. But man, he freaking nailed it. I'm like, Dana Brown cannot be the only one, you know, representing the black community as a leader in a front office. It's been such a long time. I, I don't know if you've kind of seen any thoughts that, that have kind of emerged to, to make this a more prominent issue. Uh, I think like like so many facets in America, like, you know, you got to go, go look for folks. They're out here. And when they do come, you don't turn them away. At least give them a chance. You interview them and you vet them like you do everybody else. But I think the biggest thing is in your desire to to meet that kind of a standard, you got to look for people. And I even said that I, I've been in organizations where we don't even have black interns, which is ridiculous. And it, 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 well, nobody shows up. Well, go look for them. You know, there's HBCUs out here. There's guys who are, you know, uh, business majors, uh, communications majors, you name it. You can find it. These folks are out here, but you got to look for them. You got to, you have to recruit them just like, you, you know, you recruit players that come in to be your left tackle. I mean, there's probably no greater employer of black athletes in the Southeastern Conference in football. And they do a hell of a job finding cats there. So how about doing the same, putting the same effort forth to find people who are maybe not jocks, but love athletics and could be of vital importance to a lot of organizations on the sporting scene and, and professional sports in this country. Look for them. They're out there. Go get them. Hey, Dave. SEC, it just means more, okay? Don't ever forget that. <laughs> 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 All right, I have to hey, ask I, you. I, <laughs> good line, AJ. <laughs> um, what's the best game you ever called? Ooh. Oh yeah, I know where you're going. The game that you were, that you uh, you you caught the <laughs> Philip Umber uh, no no April April twelfth I think of uh, what was it perfect Three, game get it get 12. it right per, perfect game perfect game you're right because you catch you all of them down, you you <laughs> threw down to first to get the final out of Brendan Ryan and yep. we had you on the pregame show I was working with uh, Ek er, uh, Eric Karras we had a good time and you were part of it and uh, you came on and you weren't a smart ass you did a nice job. <laughs> Do you remember? Okay, so I know that was the. I'm sure that ranks right up there with the Felix Felix Hernandez perfect game. But uh, you know, yeah, yeah, the Felix perfect <laughs> game and Cal and Cal and Cal hitting the home run to get us to the playoffs. So those are probably the top three. Okay, so the, the the story that I love to tell about that Seattle game was, I worked with EK at Fox, and the year before was my first year doing postseason. And we became buddies because we were together for like three weeks straight every day, right? So he calls me. He's like, hey, I'm doing your game on Saturday. And I'm like, sweet, you know, oh, and I'm geez. like, and I go, I go, but how did you get White Sox Mariners in April? He's like, bro, don't even tell me about it. Like, I, you know, is there are certain games you look at the schedule like, why am I doing this game? Right. So he, he comes in town. And, and if you know EK, he can be a little bitter sometimes about things. He comes in. And I, I see him in the morning. You know, he comes in. He's all like, uh. I'm like, I didn't even want to come. I can't believe I'm here. But, so then after the game, perfect game, I'm like, bet you're glad your ass came now, aren't you? Yeah, and he was like, yeah. oh, I can't believe that happened. It's the unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable thing of all time. I remember when they, they finally, you know, I think the Red Sox and the Yankees were the A game. We were the B net game. And they finally, and Matty Vasgersian was on there, and they finally came to an EK was all over. You finally come to this. We got a perfect game going. You finally now you realize <laughs> that we're alive here. Come on. <laughs> The hidden stories of broadcasting that people never know about is, yeah, you is bet. someday that, somebody's going to write a book. That was a great day, man. That was, uh, yeah, yeah, those was, hours were incredible. And Umber was, was spectacular. Yeah. I mean, and then Brendan Ryan the Felix won. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, later on in August that year, you know, uh, it was a getaway day game against Toronto. Felix like, won nothing, 12 strikeouts, perfecto place was going nuts. It, of course, now a hundred thousand people saying they were at the ballpark. <laughs> you know, they look back at it, but that was uh, that was a, that was unbelievable, and that was as special as the Umber was. Obviously, in Seattle, it was Felix. He was the height of his powers. That that was just off the chart great, man. But just fantastic. I asked. All right, let, let, let me ask you real up, quick, Dave. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. what do you got? Yeah, real quick, you know that I. Asked the, the, go ahead. My bad. My bad, AJ. Go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. So I, I was going to say, Dave, you know this that I asked for home plate they i asked them they're like do you want anything from the game and i was like 
I'd love to have home plate. And the mayor was like, no, we're going to keep that. And I was like, you want to keep the home plate your asses got perfected against? Then you guys can have it. Like, hope you all hang it up in your Hall of Fame. Because I was like, because they, they're literally like, do you want anything? And I was like, I'd love to have home plate. They're like, no, 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 we're keeping that for ourselves. I'm like, great, y'all keep it then. Hope it's hanging in your Hall of Fame. Hey, we'll get you a replica. I'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was going to ask. I, I was just going to ask real quick. I, I love the perfect game, but I just wanted to know what's more impressive, that or a guy coming to Seattle and helping a away team win the game one to nothing, but while walking on three balls. How about that? Do you remember that one? Doug Fister lost one to nothing. I walked on three pitches and ended up scoring a winning run that, to win that game. Yeah, you had to remind me, didn't you? <laughs> how about that, Crassy? How, how about from two catchers? A guy walking on three balls oh. in that game, that, that run it ends up being the winning run. And I remember looking at the book. Oh, wait a minute. I got three balls. He's at first base. This ain't right. So, but, stole know. second, stole second, sack fly, sack fly, one nothing win. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Angel might have been behind the plate. I don't know. You got the clicker. <laughs> You got the ump clicker. Can I get that clicker? Because it's broken. I don't know about you, Crouchy, but I would have lost my shit if that would happen. <laughs> it just happened in our game the other day. The other team, the other team, the guy walked. He was like, these are three pitches. I said, no, 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 no. I was like, these are the three pitches. Like, pay attention to the game. <laughs> hey, think no, this is no, the no. thing. Big league ball game. Three umpires missed it. The guy running the scoreboard missed it. Both teams missed it. How does that happen? Nope. Cam didn't miss it. I never, I never understood. Like when I, if I was in, if I was catching and a dude asked what the count was, I was like, we got this dude. He ain't into this. One. <laughs> if they had to ask what the count was, I was like, well, we got him. He ain't paying attention. That's a good call. What's the count? I'd be like, O2. Yeah, you're out. You're hitting. What's the count? O2. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You're hitting. Well, Dave, you're the best. Thank you for joining us today. It really means a lot. Um, always appreciate having you on. And we'll catch you soon and enjoy the game tonight. Please do, fellas. I enjoyed it. I catch you guys periodically uh, going in and out of games and everything. Great gig. I'm glad you guys landed. You're doing a hell of a job. And Hey, anytime, call. Anytime. Hey, Dave, you. Thank take, you. Dave, you're going to get a couple Saturdays off in June, so you just enjoy the days off, okay? We got the A team coming Good. in, okay? You take the days off. All right, you got dinner. Oh, <laughs> do it. Do He'll it. Be hey, that's fair. He'll That's be working fair. Friday night. Well, I won't be, so I'm, I'm going to put it on. I'm just going to go to a minute. restaurant and be like, Dave Sims. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Cheers. Cheers. See you, Dave. Thank right, you. Take care. Take care. You too. Uh, I can't Dave believe Sim. you got that in there. I can't believe somebody got a dinner in on AJ. It's, that's AJ's, that's AJ's go-to. Oh, man. You know what? So on Saturday, Saturday in Houston, Evan Grant, who's one of our friends, he, he was saying like, oh, you know, dinner. Dinner. Now, he was texting me, and I was like, Evan, I, I, I fly out Saturday night. He's like, nobody wants to go to dinner with me. I'm like, you can buy me dinner in the press box. Oh, they got a great nacho bar in Houston, which they do. Mm -hmm. and, and But we couldn't match up time. So he's like, next time you're in Dallas. So, Evan, I'm coming for you. There you go. Dinners with AJ. New series. Uh, injuries suck, don't they? All right, so we got a few to hit. One is super, super fresh and recent. That Red Sox game's over. The Guardians shut them out and their two best hitters collided. Did we get any updates yet on how they're doing? I'm, I'm sure the fans in the chat are probably on this quicker than we are because we've been blabbing, but we have oh, O'Neal cut his, like, it looked his face. somewhere on his face. He walked off with a bloody face. Yeah, here, here's the full video. We're looking at it. I'll give you some play-by-play -play right now. So O'Neal's coming in. Devers is backing up, and O'Neal smashes into Rafael Devers' back of his head. Both go down for a while. O'Neal got up somewhat quickly. And O'Neal left the game. Devers leaned back to catch it because it was kind of over his head. And O'Neal was leaning forward. It looked like, obviously, I haven't seen it in slow motion. Oh, man, it just looked like, looked bad. And then, yeah, he's got, <clears throat> was it a cut? Do you think it was his hat that cut him? Or, or Devers, think, back of his head hit him. Or Devers, whew. Tell you what, this is my question. What is Rafael Devers doing way out there? That, Catch, he's catching the ball is what he's doing. He caught the ball. He now, made the out. That's yeah, what he's doing. Outfitters, get out of the AJ, way. AJ, 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 come on. 
<laughs> listen, Rafi Devers, come on. You, you're here to hit. That's the shortstop left fielder's balls. What do you, come on. Come on, stop. I, I hope he you're okay, but, but Rafi, you just, you stay on, you stay as close to dirt as possible, brother. You let the shortstop go get it. It's not a lot of room out there anyway. Left fielder, shortstop probably got that ball. I'm just saying. Communication. No yeah, no talkie. No talkie. <laughs> we got to have a little communication. I got it. I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, it's official from the weekend. UCL surgery for Spencer Strider. It's the internal brace. It's not the Tommy John. He's had Tommy John already. I was trying to learn a little bit more this weekend about internal brace. I know that generally the timetable is quicker because second TJ, you're looking at a year and a half. Like He might be back late next season. Now... It could be more like early next season, it, it appears, for, for, for Strider. So there's that. And, Kratz, there's the fact that the Braves aren't running away with things <laughs> when you're missing your ace. You know, I know Ken talked about it a little bit in fair territory today, but, I mean, this dude's looked at as a top five pitcher in the bigs, and they just lost him. And their starting rotation for the playoffs might need some work. Uh, they definitely, I mean, we hit on it a little bit on Friday. I think there's, there's. I mean, you really like a Max Freed and Charlie Morton starting for you in the playoffs, but like, they're not world beaters. So my big thing is, I would love to see because of what all that and Anthopolis, Alex Anthopolis has done as a GM in Atlanta. It's all about signing these guys to extensions. They have the core of this team. You got to remember back to what he did in Toronto. A couple failed trades that netted him some good players, but he admittedly said, nah, I want to work on the clubhouse. If there's a GM with the farm system that they have with pitching, because everybody's looking for pitching, can go out and get whatever starting pitcher is available at the trade deadline, this will be the guy. Alex Anthopoulos is on the clock now to find that number one guy, unless Max Fried steps up and is the number one for their playoffs, that number two guy to slot into their playoff rotation because this is not a playoff team. This is a World Series team. They do not want to make the playoffs. They will make the playoffs. They are a World Series team. So Alex Anthopoulos is scouring the market right now to see who's available. It's in his division. His name's Jesus Lazardo, but good luck at Thank him. Thank you. Yeah, it's tough though. Here's mm -hmm. the biggest problem for Atlanta. They they have mortgaged a lot of their future to keep winning in the present in terms of prospects, which is great. I'm all for it. Like they've been a, a juggernaut and they have a World Series ch championship from 2021. They make deals, but their farm system's a little bit thin, especially compared to many other teams. Like look at what Atlanta has, especially in the upper levels of the minors versus Baltimore. It is night and oh. day. Come on. You can't compare it's anybody like, to Baltimore. You can't more, compare oh, anybody. Let's go, to, let's go through some other teams, though. Dodgers, no. night and day. Come on. Here's the thing. Like, hey. why didn't Meister tell us about this the other day when we had him on? He should have been like, I'm doing Spencer Strider's elbow. Knew. It's, it's, I think it's, what's that, what's that acronym? Meister did it. Oh, HIPAA? Know. It's called HIPAA. Oh, well. You can't talk HIPAA, about it. HIPAA, 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 HIPAA. It's a, that's a real law. Hippa <laughs> Shimippa. Yeah, but they keep producing, Scott. They keep producing pitchers. They brought – did you hear of Bryce Elder before last year? He was an all-star. No. Did you hear of Schmidt Schwarber? I understand. Sure. I understand, but these guys aren't Spencer Strider, okay? No. Nobody – come on. Oh, Just like yeah, their system's yeah. not the Orioles, nobody's system's <laughs> the Orioles. That was six years of tanking. Like, you got to compare apples to apples. You My only point up. was that Jesus Lazardo could be the prize <clears throat> of the trade deadline, and the Braves might not be first in line in terms of the prospects that they can offer. Cam, is that not a fair point? I think it's extremely fair. I mean, first off, I love he Jesus Lazardo. I think he's going to be a huge trade piece, um, but I think there are organizations that have a little more offer to offer to go get him right now. But like to add to Kratz's point, there's a such thing as called a, 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 a blueprint. And, and the Braves, they have a pretty good blueprint. We talk about Elder and talking about guys to, you know, start in their roles, do what you do best. And that's the one thing I appreciate about the Braves. They're not chasing guys uh, with velo. Yes, Spencer Strider is mm -hmm. great, but you look at Elder, 
as an example, he's a guy who he can go out and he can pitch and he can get out. So I think when we look at stuff, it's like, how can you replace Spencer Strider? You can't, right? But that doesn't mean there's not a serviceable guy down there when you look at what they've been able to do when you talk about developing pitching and getting guys to come up and, and, and do well. So it's going to be one of those situations where, you know, at no point in any season does a team win the World Series with the 25 guys that they started with. You're going to have to have guys that are going to come up, surprise you, and make an impact. And you look back and you say, hey, those moves were the moves – those moves were the reason why we were able to do this or that. And Anthopolis has been one of those guys who have made the right moves. So and, until he does it, I'm going to assume that he's going to figure out a way to go out, get a guy that maybe we may not even be looking at that comes in and, and can give them some innings. So it's going to be huge because Charlie Morton and, and, and Chris Sell, at the end of the day, you want them ready for October. You, you know, so them going out and giving you all these innings, I don't think you're looking for them to give you all those stars. I think you're trying to get them – to the end of the year, like Kratzy said. So you had those two guys, and then if anybody else can be a piece, you only need three. If you got three guys in the playoffs, you have a chance. So that's where they are. Yep. Good call. And some fans throwing Paul Blackburn's name out there. Okay, I want to see a little bit Absolutely. more. Absolutely. I got you. But I, I got you. I got you. All right, let's get to the Bet MGM game of the day, and then we'll get our locks in there too before we get to Dodgers territory. Twins Orioles, the free game of the day, streaming on the BetMGM app, live streaming available to all BetMGM customers who are logged in and have funded accounts. It's Louis Barland against Cole Irvin tonight with the Twins and the Orioles. Twins off to an eh start. They're 6-8. and eight. Orioles are 9-6. and six. Dude, I know we're not going to have time for it, but you know why I watch this game? Colton Cowser. Colton Cowser is stealing the spotlight from everyone right now in Baltimore. I mean, Jackson Holiday is first knock, which is great. Got that, you know, off his back. Colton Cowser's had two home runs per series in the last two. He's got dudes wearing cow uh, costumes at the ballpark, and they're mooing when he hits homers. They used, to moo when I, they used to moo when I played in Philly. Pretty sure it was mooing. Yeah, I don't, I don't think yeah. it was. It might have been. I like mooing. that. He's they're booing our picks, actually. Yeah, they're, they're booing our picks. We had a rough Friday, so let's turn it around here. Money bags are a little shaky besides our guy, Pap. Pap did a great job on the uh, on the Nesson post game, which is over now. That's why you're with us. If you're a Boston fan, but here's a great minute of Pap in case you're snoozing right now. A little caffeine boost on his pick today. What do you got, Pap? What's up, foul territory nations? John Falvon here. I'm with the Hall of Famer right here. We in studio, Jim Rice, right. TC over there. He's hard at work. Let's go. But we're gonna give you all our picks today. Of course, it's Jackie Robinson Day, so we're gonna take the Dodgers and we're gonna parlay them. With the Royals playing the White Sox because the White Sox just fucking suck. And uh, we got to keep riding them. <laughs> and when they suck, you keep playing against them. So uh, that puts us at plus 102. We're going to bet 200. And we're going to win 400. Right, Jim? That's right. Pat. And you got to bet on the Dodgers and Jackie Robinson Day, right? Got that right, my boy. Mookie bet. Yeah, all right. We out. Peace. <laughs> hey, Pap, I'm taking the Indians. I mean, the Guardians. And I'm going to get... Four and a half runs against your Red Sox, and I'm going to bet a million on them for today's game. That game is over for the crowd. Good job, Pat. Uh, let's run through this, though. Um, Kratz, do you have a parlay, too? Yep, I'm going run line for the for the Royals, and I'm going money line. Sorry, sorry, Jay. <laughs> and I'm going and I'm going money line. I had run line for the Phillies playing the Rockies. Nola on the mound. Cal Quantrill on the mound. Cal Quantrill's given up four plus runs in all three of his starts this year, and so I had it run line, but I went money line, and I think it's coming out at plus one sixty six. So I'm putting a hundred down to win the boys one sixty six. Let's do it. Chuck didn't do much convincing there. I'll I'll go Rangers money line. They haven't been playing great. They lost two out of three to the. Astros this weekend, two out of three to Oakland last week, but they're minus 125. Reese Olsen looked really bad against Pittsburgh. I think the Texas offense will pick it back up. Going off some patterns here. Also, I just think, you know, using the secondary a lot from Olsen, velocity on that fastball, but not a ton of movement. Um, so I'll go Rangers here to, to bounce back. Their offense is better than this. 125 to win a hundo. Uh, I'm going over 10 in Houston. The Braves versus Houston. Vine starting for Atlanta against Houston, and an offense that's hot right now, mm -hmm. right? And then Eric Getty is pitching for Astros. He is their last, like, big prospect to have in the minor leagues. 
He first start, he ain't do so good. Mm -hmm. Not very good. And guess who he gets to face his second start? The Braves. ATL. In Houston. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to be – there's no way this can't be a high-scoring game. So, it's minus 110, throwing 110 down to win 100. So, boom, it's easy money. Go ahead. I ain't no sucker. Good luck. Ain't no Cam, sucker. you're up. Well, that's a hard slate, but you know what? I'm going to go with a team who has no identity, but they look like they're still having fun down in Miami. I'm going to go with the Marlins money line at minus 105. Cabrera on the mound, right? This is the day and age of stuff. He has all the stuff that you need. Nice five-pitch mix, a lot of fastballs, change-ups, and sliders. Give me the Marlins at the crib. Damn, dude, bet with your head, not with your heart, bro. Oh, save it. Hey, hey, this is you, you the Cabrera's guy. Holler at me tomorrow, all right? Holler at me tomorrow yeah. when this game is over. I'm telling you. Oh, the Braves just came in and just beat the crap out of that bullpen. Yeah, the Marcelo Zuna Marcelo Zuna. You know what? Jesus Lazardo shouldn't have stepped on his toe. That pissed him off, and then he went way back. <laughs> Jesus Lazardo stepped on his toe. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm telling it, all right? Bonus code is FOUL, F-O-U-L, when you download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com and sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. That's it. A quickie super chat here, question from Mike that I told him we would get to later. So Mike said, I'd love to know Cameron Maben's comments on the New York radio talk shows. Oh, well, they always know. Uh, complaining about Soto, quote, looking for walks. Your, your thoughts, I'm, glad we got, I'm glad we've got guys following right now, hopping on foul territory. That, so that was from a tweet the other day. And it listen, it pissed me off. And, I, you know, this is new to me. I take this serious and I don't want to be those guys just giving – you know, takes for clicks. And it, I don't even know the guy's name, but he was just complaining about the other night, the scenario where Soto walked and got Aaron Judge to the plate. Aaron <laughs> Judge, the guy that you brought in to hit in front of him for these situations so you could put more runners out there, more ducks on the pond. And this guy is literally, what is Soto doing? you got to be kidding me. We didn't bring him in here to walk. And it's like literally, like one pitch was close. He, like that's what he does. He gets on base. He gives your team the opportunity to win, and we're complaining. So I just, you know, it's hard for me to see everybody with a platform that just can just spew nonsense, you know. So I just want to, I want to say, I, you know, to that tweet, I appreciate the real baseball fans that appreciate what Juan Soto actually brings to a team. Nailed it. Love that. There you go, Mike. There's your reply. Also, for talk on the other coast, Dodgers territory will follow this show. Alana Rizzo and Clint Pasias standing by. And again, tons to talk about, including what we covered at the very tippy top of the show. Mr. Irrelevant or Mr. Relevant, Jackson, uh, Jerks and Profar against the Dodgers. Uh, they have a few other spicy topics to get to. I'll let them handle that coming up in just a few. Also, shout out to some of us heading out to Cincinnati. Todd Father hitting a flight tomorrow night. We'll be doing the show live from the BetMGM Sportsbook at the Banks in Cincinnati. If you're in that area and you watch or listen, swing by, say hello Wednesday or Thursday. Friday, we'll do a meet and greet at the Sportsbook. And then, or actually reverse this, we'll do the show on the field. A little Mike Trout action. I think he's coming on. And Ellie De La Cruz, those are my two requests. And I was told that it is likely. So I'm throwing the, the PR teams up there. Help us out. And then... Uh, we will go to the sportsbook for a little meet and greet before we take off. So we're going to have some fun in Cincinnati this week for the show. Uh, Kratz hats, what do you got? My Giants, San Francisco Giants hat with the 42 logo on the side. Like, are you serious? Like, it's so fresh. Like, this logo is fire. Okay, so Cam, what we do here on this show is you got to grade the hat. Uh, I'm going to give it a uh man, I'm gonna give it eight for the, the size that it probably is. <laughs> oh, that's good. A, a, a you should give it a B then, cause it's big. I gave it. Oh, you gave it an eight. One to ten. I, I gave it a, from my my scale was one to ten. I'm gonna give it an eight. Oh, an eight, eight. for the size. <laughs> saying a for your noggin. <laughs> a for the big old big old head. Other than the Jackie Rob. I know you. Uh, other than the Jackie know. Robinson pouch, that's a. See it for me. Say so you you ain't feeling the Jackie Robinson logo. No, no, no. I said for, if it wasn't for the Jackie Robinson, but look, I mean, 
That's your. I'm that's gonna give you an eight, Kratzy. You're you an eight, my guy. I, I like it. You got this Jackie Robinson day. <laughs> Appreciate it. And we can't even get my picture on. We ain't got no time. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. What, d- doesn't oh, work yeah, tomorrow. Get my pictures what, right oh, now, what's your man, picture? Let's All right, let's get it. Let's get it. I didn't know what your picture. I ain't coaching is. no more. What's your picture? I didn't know what it is. A picture. We got a picture of me for Jackie Robinson it's a Day. Jackie Robinson Day pictures. But then yes, you're right. It's it's not right. Oh, we can't tomorrow. even show it. We can show it. We can try. There it is. Let's go. Hey, look at them love handles. Cam, look at them love handles coming out below the four <laughs> hey, and the two. Hey, hey, that was my wow. year, AJ, man. Hey, AJ was good, man. I don't care what everybody else says about AJ. You all right with me, man. <laughs> love handles? There ain't no love handles. Baby, talk about Bo Porter. Cam, you're the best. <laughs> that was fun. Dodgers territory. We'll see everyone tomorrow on this show. <laughs>